Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. And thank you so much for taking time out and joining us here on our first ever uh, virtual school conference. So welcome to you all from, I can see on the chat, there's people here from Malaysia, Oman, Spain, um, Mexico. So whatever time of day it is, thank you so much for taking time out of your holidays to join us. Um, a quick bit of housekeeping before we get started. Most of you have already noticed the chat functionality on the right hand side. There is also a um, question button, which is a private questions, so you can uh, post any questions and the team are there to to help you out. So um, there is also hashtag frog20 if you would like to tweet. We've also got a little bit of fun going on today, which is about tweeting your seat and you can tweet the various positions that you're sitting in and all the things that might be around your desk. And Mark Anderson in his presentation later on around uh, lunchtime, so in about three hours time, will be uh, announcing the winner of that. So. Um, first up, I would like to introduce our first speaker and to open the day is our founder and managing director, Gareth Davies. So good morning, Gareth. Morning, Lucy. Good morning. Um, how are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. Very well, looking forward to this morning. So we're very much looking forward to hearing from you. So I will disappear from the screen now and hand straight over to you. Thank you for taking time, Gareth. Okay, thanks, Lucy. So welcome everyone, as Lucy said, to our first ever virtual frog conference. Uh, Lucy assures me nothing will go wrong. All of your internets will be perfect. Uh, your computers will not hang. Everything will be, will be marvelous. Um, so as you, I don't know if that's true, by the way, I'm sure Amazon will turn up at my door in a minute. Um, so as you can imagine, we've been really busy at Frog since uh, March. The usage from existing customers as uh, skyrocketed as they've become entirely dependent on on the technology uh, and a lot of schools suddenly wanting to uh, get on board with um, with virtual virtual learning and the creation of virtual schools um, I'm hugely proud of, of frog and the people in it at how we've coped to, not just from the technology but from the support and how we've looked after people but more than that and what today is really about I'm hugely proud of what the schools have achieved. There's been some phenomenal successes. Uh, and as you'll know, not everybody's dealt with this crisis as well as, as each other. So today is about grabbing those great examples of how schools are providing um, a full curriculum education to their children, even though those children aren't in school, in the hope that others can pick up those examples and, and run with them. So going forward, uh, I don't think any of us know what the next 12 months holds, could be more than 12 months, um, I'm, I'm aware that in Dubai, a, uh, a policy uh, has, has, has gone in, which is that from September, every school must provide home learning provision. And that strikes me as a, a really sensible policy. There could be more lockdowns. There's various polls around the world that show that many parents don't want to send their children back uh, and we can't not educate them. So I, I, anybody who's not looking at providing virtual learning for children at home at the minute probably probably needs to get a wiggle on, uh, I, I would think. So as I've said, today is a different type of frog conference, not just because it's virtual, Normally we have a big song and dance and we show off the latest technology and what we've done and what we're doing. That's not today. If anybody wants to, to see that, we'll probably do something later in the year or something. Today is just about sharing those stories of how to deal with problems that we all, that we all face all over the world um, today. Um, that's it. The chat is enabled, as you'll notice. Um, the, we're not quite the YouTube generation, but I'm sure we'll get used to your comments. Um, please feel free um, to ask questions on there and we'll try and deal with them throughout the day if we are fully able to. I hope you find the day useful. Um, I, I hope in some way it contributes to um, uh, helping helping the children get, get some kind of education over the next 12 months. Um, that's all from me. I hope you enjoy the day. Thank you very much. And um, back to Lucy. Gareth, thank you again for taking time to open the conference today and hopefully we'll hear more from you later on. Um, just to reiterate what you said really, this conference isn't just for frog schools, there are both frog schools and non-frog schools talking today. Um, and there's, there's just two things that really we hope you get out of it. One is that hopefully you'll hear something today that you can take back and implement in your school. And the second thing that you feel that you're not alone. This this. 
um, has been affecting everybody across the globe. So um, we, we really do hope you get something from today. So um, first up this morning is one of our key speakers, and this is um, Nick House. Now, Nick House is the head teacher from Greenshaw High School here in the UK. Uh, Nick has talked at several frog conferences before. In fact, last year, he commanded an audience of about 100 uh, in a classroom experience. Um, and we were very much uh, told what to do and how to behave. And it was really exciting. So hopefully, Nick will be joining me on stage uh, as we speak. Uh, good morning, Nick. How are you? Uh, good morning, Lucy. Yeah, I'm very well, thank you, and delighted to be meeting so many people from so many places around the world. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, I'm going to disappear now and let you speak. So thank you very much for taking the time out of your, your summer holidays to join us today. No problem at all. So I'm going to um, hopefully make this work um, and particularly share with people my experiences of what we've done as a school. Um, and it's really exciting to see that we've got folks from Malaysia, from Amman, and from Grimsby and the lakes as well. Um, we've worked with Frog for a long time, but actually what I'd just like to do is to share some of our experiences as a head teacher and as somebody working in a school. The first thing that struck me about this whole process about online learning, remote learning, and working during a lockdown was really that it shows your values as a school. So what I'm going to share is how we made our way through. And Gareth talked about at the beginning that some schools have been more successful and some schools have been less successful. Um, I wouldn't say we've been extraordinary, but I think we've done some things that we're pretty proud of. And I'm just going to share with you some of the things. Now, in the first two weeks of lockdown in the UK, there was only three days notice. Um, and so we had to come up with a plan at very short notice that didn't have lots of online videos and didn't have lots of content, but was really about supporting families and young people with their structure. Um, and I was quite cautious, for instance, about saying things like, should we tell teenagers in our school what they should be doing, particularly about what time they wake up, um, about some aspects of their routine? But if you look at the screen in front of you, you'll see that we were really, really clear about what a structured day at home should look like. So the areas in this yellow area are things that I think I would describe as being more about general well-being. So we knew that adults who work from home have generally found that structure and repeated routines keep them more productive. And although I definitely don't want to think that 11 and 12 and 13 year olds are like mini workers working in industry, I think there are learns that we can take from successful people working from home. And the risks of being at home are so many distractions. So we were really brave in the first couple of days and we decided we would give pupils a schedule, not a timetable, but a schedule. Um, and so we would tell them roughly what time they should be waking up, what they should be doing in the middle of the day. Um, this day goes longer. I've just screenshotted the first two thirds of it. Um, what they should be doing at lunchtime. And interestingly, things like they should be chatting with family, siblings, be in touch with friends, not just picking up a device for social media or something like that. Now, we have a tutor reading program, which means that in morning registration in our school, our young people read a piece of fiction or nonfiction, and it's read by the tutor to the pupils. So we made that available via YouTube. We recorded the tutor reading with a copy of the book, and we had that read out every single day. And we wanted to keep the routine of school going at home. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at a later point. We also, as you can see on the right hand side, use Frog as our absolute host for everything. Because our homework is set on Frog already, it meant that people were really, really familiar with logging into Frog to access their independent learning. Um, I always say at these events, I'm not a Frog ambassador, I'm not paid by Frog or in any way um, on their payroll. But for us, we use it as the single platform that then hosts lots and lots of other related areas. So we can embed a YouTube video, for instance, on Frog. So everything that you can see on this screen here are things that we already had and that we were able to structure fairly quickly. 
But I said at the beginning, it's about your values as a school. And our values as a school are very much about well-being and a holistic understanding of the young person. I'm really proud that as head teacher, I lead a school consortium of 15 primary, special and secondary schools across Sutton who are working with the NHS. And we talk all the time about mental health and well-being. And one of the principles that absolutely instructed our work around this was that these five principles outlined by the Mental Health Foundation are the sorts of things we try and have in our school. So if they're what you want in your school, they're things that we should have when pupils were forced to work from home. And so a couple of examples, for instance, on here, the get active. You'll see that activity is part of here and here. Um, and giving to others is something that we absolutely promoted um, in a number of different activities. So, for instance, we asked our pupils to write to care homes, to NHS centres around our school, and to actually reach out to those people at the absolute depth of the pandemic who were working incredibly hard. Um, that's not here because it's on the lower part of the schedule, but that is another activity we asked people to do, a letter writing activity. And so, therefore, all these five principles ran through what we try to do in the first two weeks. Now, if you look at the screen, you might think it's not particularly exciting. Um, it's not particularly technologically able. Um, and you're right, because we got to some much more sophisticated plans over the next month. So we had two weeks before lockdown in the UK at the end of the Easter term. Then we had a two week holiday. And over that holiday, we got together what phase two would actually look like. But I was struck by how positive the parents were even about this first quite simple phase. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples, but these are only a couple of examples of what parents said about what we were doing. Um, I've, I'm honest, I was a little anxious what we're doing wasn't really as sophisticated as it could be, but I think by comparison with others, we had some really clear values. Structure, social communication, some learning, some family time. Um, and a couple of parents said things like this. Now, my purpose in having a conversation this morning is absolutely not to say we're an amazing school and why isn't everybody a bit more like us? It's much more to say there are things that we've learned and lots of things we learn from others when collaborating. So I think it's quite interesting the things that the parents have picked out. Um, important to keep the structure and learning. Um, the information provided on the website is astounding i think that might be a bit of an overreach um, but a very kind comment um, structure was absolutely key for us and making sure that parents knew as much as possible was absolutely essential for us now that second comment talks about the schedule i've just shown you a bit of me thinking is it sophisticated enough does it have enough going on but at the time of the first lockdown in the UK, I think parents were really, really uncertain about what it was going to look like. So I actually think having quite an analogue solution, just referencing to some online resources, was probably quite good in phase one. In phase two, however, we had a further month of development time, the first two weeks of lockdown where we kept the kids busy and the two weeks of the Easter holidays to really move on to something a little bit more impressive. Now, in our school, we already have a particular way of teaching. We don't have a set lesson structure, but we do have certain expectations. And just like every pupil was used to starting the day with tutor reading in the morning at 8.30, there are certain things our pupils expect when they arrive in our classrooms. And um, the first of these is not absolutely original. Um, you might recognise um, some of the phrases later on from other places like Doug Lamov's Teach Like a Champion um, and any of you involved in education research, you will notice some of these features. But we planned our lesson in four phases. And I think that was really important for online learning because young people had to feel a familiar structure to all of their lessons. So this one is taken from our geography bank. You can see it says lesson 19, impacts of water insecurity. But the lesson in four phases header at the top of this slide applied to every single lesson. Now, as educationalists, we're probably on a massively wide spectrum um, from progressive, liberal, real um, creation, 
based educationalists to very much more the worst term um, is drill and kill. I don't like that. Um, but we will all have a range of views on the importance of knowledge, the importance of creativity, um, and some spectrum around that. For me, however, when we talk about remote learning, a familiar and repeat structure is absolutely key. I don't think young people can make good sense of education when they can't ask adults. They don't have a learning support assistant next to them or a teacher at the front. I don't think they make sense out of learning unless there is a clear structure. And our structure was based as closely as possible about what they'd recognise from the classroom. So we start all our lessons in school with a do now. And that's a term you might recognise from Doug Lamov, the author of the brilliant Teach Like a Champion, the handbook that talks about American charter schools and what they've done. So a do now in school is where pupils come in, get themselves ready, and there's a quiz, basically, on the board. Uh, there needs to be very little teacher instruction. The pupils in the best classrooms come in, sit down in silence and complete the do now. And it's a quiz that checks what they understood from last lesson. In the best classrooms, the teachers can actually use that as a really easy low stakes assessment. Sometimes we don't go through all the answers. It was really important that we had a structure that kids were familiar with. So I'll take an example now from our lesson structure and what it looked like on screen. So this lesson, if you remember, was about the impact of water insecurity. And here are five questions. And this is exactly what our pupils would expect in lessons and exactly what we replicated for them online. Now, I really enjoy frog conferences, especially being there live. Um, I can't see the chat pane right now because I'm showing my screen. But if I was in a live conference or able to see the chat screen, I might be able to ask you to answer those five questions. Um, if we were live in a conference building, then obviously we could actually see who knew what and make sure that we're all super aware of things that 13 year olds in the UK already knew. Um, but if not, here are the answers. Feel free on the comments pane to give me a mark. You scored out of five on that. But the most important thing, if I go back a slide, is that we had a lesson that was familiar to pupils from A, what they knew in school, and B, all their online lessons were going to follow a familiar structure. So the do now is something that we expected kids to recognise and it helped them know the familiarity of the lesson. So the second phase after do now was the phase of, I guess, content, the main lesson input. And we were really, really fortunate that in the majority of cases, we were able to record these. Now, because we're quite a big school, we've got 1,800 pupils. That means that in the geography department, as an example, we have six geography teachers. And we were able to distribute the curriculum to each of those teachers. So teachers did not need to write the same lesson for each of their year eight classes because that would have been incredibly inefficient. And so what we were able to do was to scale this out really, really straightforwardly. So this is an example of the main lesson input. Um, the teacher down at the bottom, Andy, our head of geography, if this was a streaming video, is live talking and he's combined some images and some text um, and we'll be audio talking across it. Now, in our school, we have about 30% pupil premium, which in the UK means disadvantaged pupils. So we weren't certain that we could have live teaching because we know that not all of our pupils have access to a device and they definitely don't all have access to their own device at the same time. So we recorded these as videos that pupils could download and could access at different times of the day. Um, that was our best solution for our setting. We're all in different settings around the world in different types of schools. Um, and you will know whether live videos are a possibility or not. But actually what we learned was that having all of our lessons across the curriculum in familiar phases, it didn't matter whether it was live or recorded. That familiarity enabled learners to engage more successfully. After the main lesson input, we then had a brief quiz. So the videos might be between 16 to 20 minutes. Um, that's a lot of content. In a classroom, good teachers use lots of non-verbal communication. They're scanning the room. They're looking at kids' eye contact. Yes, I know you're looking at what they write down, but actually you can pick up on the non-verbal communication of how well they're 
absorbing the content. So before we moved on to any task, we had a short quiz that just enabled pupils to check if they understood what had happened in the video. And if not, because it was a video, not a live lesson, they could always scrub back on the video and try and find any section that they weren't short on. Um, and I think that was a really, really important feature. We know in classrooms we can have teachers talking and delivering input and then pupils just, we hope, absorb it, but we never fully know that. Um, so we did a short quiz at the end of the main lesson input to help pupils self-assess. Low stakes, not taking any marks, not taking any scores, just enabling pupils to have a bit of responsibility for their own learning. And so it looks something like this down at the bottom. Um, and again, the familiar format for every single lesson. So these icons, the multiple question marks, were not used by each individual subject teacher, but were used across the platform exactly the same every single lesson. And then at the end of the lesson, the fourth phase was an extended response where we we're asking pupils to actually write an answer. Um, and we did use the Frog platform to hand this in. Um, so this is an embedded PDF here. You can see this one is from a year 10 geography learning lesson, um, looks at the exam spec, and they could type their answers into the box, and that was submitted to the teacher. Now, because we're quite a large school, we didn't make a commitment with year 10, for example, that we would mark every single piece of writing. We did say we'd mark one piece of writing a fortnight, and we also said we would sample lessons, um, and particularly sample pupils' extended tasks, these, and we kept a log of the pupils we sampled so that we made sure over time that we sampled different pupils by gender, attainment, ability, and then we gave general feedback to the cohort. So in geography, we have about 120 pupils in year 10. If we sample, say, 10 of those pupils, rather than mark all of them, we were able quite quickly to pick up some diagnostic feedback that was really, really helpful for the students. Now, the advantage of the lesson in four phases that we went for was twofold. Firstly, familiarity with pupils having uh, a very predictable and secure environment in which they were learning. Secondly, it really helped teacher planning. So rather than having any kind of issues with different expectations from teachers, um, different types of content, it meant that we were able to make the stress levels of our staff reduced because they knew what the framework was they were producing for. Inevitably, when we learn new routines, the first couple of attempts take a bit of time. Cognitively, it's hard work to get used to new routines. But once you establish those patterns, it becomes incredibly efficient. And that's something that I think definitely advantage the pupils, but also advantage our staff. Now, as people who use the Frog platform in my school um, at Greenshaw High School, we were also incredibly happy that we could use a lot of data analysis so we could see how many pupils had logged on. We could see when they'd access the resources. Even if they hadn't submitted the extended writing, we would know if they'd been online and we were then able to make contact with them via the form tutors and the heads of year to check out A, have there been any technical issues, but B, have there been any subject-based issues? So the lesson in four phases was really important and hosting it on a platform that gave us the ability to know who had done what was also incredibly important. And then the last thing um, I just wanted to share was going back to that broad principle from the Mental Health Foundation and um, connecting. So phase one was talking about the first two weeks where we scrambled stuff together. Phase two was where we had a much more coherent learning package in a four phase lesson for each subject. And then phase three was connecting. Um, by which I mean staying in the community. So it's really, really important for me that our school is a community. We're a very, very suburban school. The vast majority of our pupils don't use public transport. About 90% of our pupils walk to our school. Um, and whether you're in a school that has pupils using all forms of private and public transport, or whether you're in a school like ours that has everybody walking on foot, it doesn't matter. As soon as they come into our building, we hopefully believe we're constructing a community. So. Going back to the Mental Health Foundation principle of connecting, we also try to do things beyond just the really, really important stuff around learning. 
So we sent texts, emails and made phone calls to families and students around what they'd done, particularly recognition texts. So we aim to have contact with every pupil's family at least once a week. Now, in a big secondary school of 1,800 pupils, that can be a real challenge. Um, so we made it systematic by using some of the analytic data off our database, we were able to then pull down the pupils who had had greatest contact, uh, the pupils who had made the biggest changes, and we were able to send some quite intelligently worded emails and communications that were generic, but if you craft them right, they don't come across as standard. We're all used to receiving standard communication from companies and corporations, but if you can actually word them in a smart way, you can make it seem like they've got a level of individuality around them, and that was incredibly well received by our families. It also gave the pupils a sense that they were working for something. They would have got very little feedback otherwise. They would have been pumping work into the ether and not necessarily sure that it was being picked up or being responded to by people. So because of our values as a school about trying to connect everybody together, we couldn't just send them away and not speak to them for 14 weeks. We absolutely had to connect with them. And um, that meant really trivial things. I was really proud that every form tutor contacted every young person on the date of his or her birthday. Um, that may not seem like something that education is all about, um, but for me, I thought that was an incredibly important thing and families and pupils really, really appreciated it. Alongside the Zoom meetings, the online assemblies, et cetera, et cetera. I think a birthday is a really nice thing. If a pupil's birthday falls in term time and they're working from home, I think that's a lovely thing to do. We're part of a wider multi-academy trust called the Greenshaw Learning Trust um, and they instituted something called Fun Friday, which was an event every Friday that pupils not just in our school but across the whole group of schools could collaborate in and get involved in. So some of them would be, for instance, an art challenge. So we might set an art challenge about something like um, a celebration of the NHS, the National Health Service in our local area and what they were doing and we got over two to 300 pupils submitting artwork from a range of schools all on a Friday. And I thought that community effort really pulled together, not just pupils in our school, but pupils across a group of schools working together. Um, and for those of you working across groups of schools, um, that might be something that you would want to consider. Um, if you look at the Twitter feed um, for the Greenshaw Learning Trust, you will see Fun Friday um, as an item on there and some more examples of that. But most importantly, um, I hope you can see a sense of our values as a school. We are a school that's incredibly passionate about the curriculum and about learning, but we're also incredibly passionate about young people being OK and their families being OK. So for me, to summarise, what we pulled together at the end of this experience was all about structure, connection, well-being and making sure that staff and pupils were supported as well as possible. So I'm not an expert. We haven't done anything that lots of other schools haven't done. And there may be things in there that you think, well, we smash that. Um, but I hope you get a sense of interest and particularly a sense of what we're doing that might just give you a few pauses for the point. Nick, that was absolutely fantastic. I know you couldn't see the chat uh, when you were presenting, but that was absolutely going wild. And um, everybody um, agreeing with you about the structure, about parents not being teachers, about familiarisation um, and about getting the right content across the, the kids their well-being. So thank you very much for spending that time with us this morning. I hope, uh, I know you're going to stay around for the panel discussion and hopefully for, for the rest of the morning too. So thank you very much. No problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Bye, Nick. So um, next up, I, I visited this school, Wally Range High School, the day before, I think it was, the school closed. And I, I met with Kate and I said, Kate, is there anything that we could do to help? Are you all right if, if the schools do close? And, uh, and she went, nah, we've got it covered. So I asked Kate to come here today and, and talk about how she had that covered, but also really what she's planning next. So um, thanks, Kate, for joining us. I know you've had a few issues trying to get online this morning. It's not a proper, uh, it's not a proper webinar, is it, unless somebody's got a problem? Oh, absolutely. Right, I'm going to hand straight over to you, Kate. Thank you so much for being here. No problem. Um, 
I'm hoping that you can see my screen. Is that okay for everyone? Okay, so really, um, Lucy asked me to talk about um, the curriculum and about how we've got everything covered. It was very kind of her to say that we've got everything covered. Um, and really, when she came up with the, the title, Five Ways to Prepare for Phase Two, I suppose one of the things that occurred to me was um, what's phase two? Because phase two is, um, you know, it, what is it exactly? It's it, even the wheel has to evolve. Even the wheel has to move. Sorry, I'm just moving my screen a bit. Even the wheel has to evolve. Um, and e-learning have been around for decades. It's certainly something that I've been working on for ages, but that global plan pandemic hit us out of the blue. So our strategies have, were tested. Uh, they're not new, but they did need reshaping. And one of the things that we were looking at was about um, working towards September and what we're going to do. So I'm going to share with you now over the next few minutes is really some of our journey into how we worked through the pandemic and about how we're going to move forward now into September. And stage one really was to think about what just happened, you know, what really just hit us. I don't know if it was just me, but did everyone heave a sigh of relief in July because the pressure was intense. But the question that I've got really is what's happened to your learning platforms since the end of half term six? We need to really have a think about what happened before we could move forward. So one of the things that I've done is I've audited our VLE, our learning platform, to have a look to see where we ended up. Certainly we all started off working in the same direction, but perhaps it didn't quite look the way that we were imagined back at that point where it was all just one of those wonderful, nice to have things. So I've been looking through with faculties, auditing their work, checking what they've been doing, looking really to see what were the sorts of activities that generated the most uh, emails in terms of I need help, looking to see what were the activities that had got the highest level of engagement. And we did have some pretty high levels of engagement with some of the students. We've been tracking um, every week as well. Uh, one of the big things for me was how easy is it to navigate the site? Uh, and I keep thinking about a little, I talked to Lucy and I know she'll smile when I say this, but. I talked to Lucy about, you know, an 11 year old sitting there with a mobile phone and a lot of our families, um, English isn't their first language. So those students who are sitting there, not very confident with their English, with a mobile phone, what do these things actually look like? Staff have worked so hard and have produced so much stuff. I suppose my concern was, have they actually gone a little bit too far with some of their stuff? And also with the devices that the students have, although we've done technology surveys and we'll be doing technology surveys again, you know, I think as teachers, we work on uh, trying to pack as much as we can, as much information as we can into PowerPoint screens. But what would those actually look like on the devices in the hands of the children? So one of my first things to do before September is to be utterly ruthless. Uh, make sure that everything's cleared out, cleared down. We're switching off. We actually had school closure pages in place anyway. Uh, we had those. Uh, do you remember the beast when the beast from the east was the only thing we had to worry about? But we actually had school closure pages in place ready to go then. But we do need to clear, do a lot of clearing out. And then step two really is to be prepared. We've got actual um, inset time uh, planned in September for people to start to, to look at the online learning space as well as all of the physical spaces. I mean, maybe we're not looking at fire and flood and radiation, but we do need to think about how our systems will cope in the next academic year. It's important, I think, when we're planning the curriculum moving forward that we need to think about what will work if we have to go back online and what will work if we're going face to face. There are some uh, topics which I'd only like to do in the classroom and so it's important that we prioritise teaching those. But there are some things that we can do online, but 
one of the plans that we're working through with our heads of faculty now is to make sure that that curriculum planning is um, agile enough to be able to switch between the two different systems. We certainly, one of the things that we found uh, with the staff is that they like to present the big picture. They like to present everything on screen, all of the lessons, here's the whole topic, here's the whole unit. But we found very quickly that the students got very confused about that. And maybe the, the audience for that big picture stuff isn't all of the children. Maybe the audience for that are parents or other teachers. So again, one of the things that we're looking at for September is that the things that are there online, ready to go, are small, small learning experiences, small learning episodes that are very clearly signposted and which have some really consistent instructions. Again, one of the things I found is that staff, as time went on, the use of some of their language slipped. So they would use um, a phrase in a notice about a piece of work that didn't quite match with the piece of work that they were sending out or that was the, the piece that was in the assignment. And so it's important that we just sort of regroup and regather, really. The DFE have been putting out an awful lot of information in the last few weeks. Some of it uh, has been quite controversial, uh, but towards the end of lockdown, they did actually put out some advice about September and whether you like it or not, whether you go with it or not. Uh, the, one of the sections was about moving forward. By the end of September, we all have to have systems that offer interaction, assessment and feedback. And those aren't bad things to start with. If you take my presentation away at the end, you'll see that I've actually listed all the ways in which FROG is used in our schools to, to address all of those things. But it was quite important and we found out quite early on that there's some staff confidence was quite low as well as some student confidence. And so if you are going to look for ways of being interactive, if you are going to look for ways of assessing students, the phrase that we worked on was that it was better to do two things really well as a subject than do several things really badly. And so we've spent quite a lot of time working with our heads of faculty, working with SLT to make sure that each faculty, each subject area has got the best ways that work for them online, but that every single person in that faculty is able to do them. And that could be from audio uh, lessons, it could be um, assessments using Educate or some other online uh, third parties. It could be in terms of returning work through assignments or through shared document spaces, because we also use uh, Teams and we use Microsoft. But I think it's important to have that discussion when you're not actually in that lockdown scenario and you're in that panicking scenario, it's important to have those conversations where you've got a little bit of time and you've got a little bit of flexibility to work on it. Step four is very easy, really. And uh, if you type model into Google Images, you just get lots of pictures of, uh, of uh, supermodels, but I went with Lego. Uh, and the really step four for us is model, 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 model. Because when we do come back in September, and we will have face-to-face -face contact in September, none of us are quite sure at this point in time how long that contact is going to be before we might be going back into a local lockdown or possibly um, a, a, a bubble closure. So what we are asking our staff to do from September is to really maximise that time in the classroom. We want every teacher, every lesson, every time to model where some of this information is coming from. So rather than allowing staff to open uh, PowerPoints from personal saving areas, we're asking people to go through those learning platforms to keep modeling to students how to get to some of that work. You can experiment with lots of different things. We had some wonderful conversations with students during the lockdown about what was really working for them and what wasn't. But if you've got the chance to experiment, to try setting some work with students, before um, you actually end up in a closure scenario, ask them what works, get them to trial it out. And don't forget to try and enlist the help of your friendly computing department who um, 
I know in our schools, the computing department are working with the key stage three students in half term one to make sure that they all can access everything, to make sure that if they're going to be working on a phone, if they're going to be working on a laptop or an iPad, they're really confident about their online storage, they're really confident about their online file organisation. I do think it's sometimes we get carried away with some of the really uh, able students and it's actually some of the weaker students that we need to work on. And my step five really is about our staff and I can't emphasize enough how brilliant our staff have been. Those of you who are Pixel Schools will recognize PLC as a personalized learning checklist, but I'm old enough to remember when that stood for professional learning community. I have to say our staff have been absolutely brilliant. Um, when we started this, we realized that actually some of our staff skills were things that we needed to address. Um, and we have a digital working group that started very small, really, a few super geeks, if you like, who were happy to try things out, happy to fail uh, and work with students. And their focus has always been on pedagogy. We've never, ever, ever let the tech get in the way of the learning. Um, we challenge ourselves. Our favorite question to each other is, so what? You show me something really fancy and brilliant, the question that I'm gonna come straight back is, so what? Does that actually help me? Does that actually help the young person with their learning? Our staff were brilliant, absolutely brilliant in taking the courses. And there are lots of courses out there. If you haven't looked at some of the Microsoft um, Professional Educator, if you haven't looked at the Google stuff, the Apple stuff, there are some superb courses out there and people were really willing to learn. The mantra became uh, no teacher left behind. Again, our story is on the slides if you want to take this. And the at the end of the academic year certainly the the general consensus is that people want to keep this group going they want to start challenging each other we'd already started to do this between schools as a cross trust um development area by the end of lockdown and we want to continue that into half term one um one of the big things for us at the moment is, is about assessing the quality of the assessment that's happening. If we're using quizzes, if we're using third party software, does it really give us the information that we need? Again, we don't want to do things because they're super shiny. We want to do things because they actually mean something to the children. So that leaves us back where we are at our final reiteration as well. What's the next wheel going to look like? I have absolutely no idea. I don't think any of us do. But I do know that I've got some amazing, um, amazing staff who will work and to, to move heaven and earth for our students. I know we've got some amazing students who will really come on this journey with us. And I know that we've got mechanisms in place and we've got agreements and we've got principles in place. That means that we can adapt. We've already proved that we can do it. I'm sure we can do it again. We've got the willingness to do it and now we've got even more expertise to do it. So moving into September, no teacher left behind, no child left behind, uh, and more importantly, just to make sure that the learning stays relevant, makes it stay fun and really keeps it, keeps it together for the kids, which is what we're all here for in the first instance. So those are my five steps, my journey moving forward. Um, thank you. Kate, thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's so important to remember that actually our teachers probably need a little bit of hand holding, especially in those early stages of lockdown, because although you're modeling and you're you're getting what's right for the students, it's got to be what's right for the teachers as well. And I think uh, uh, looking at what's what's going to happen in the next wheel, or what does the next wheel look like is great. So <laughs> absolutely no idea. I, absolutely. Yeah, we, we discovered that actually it was our teacher skills that needed as much TLC as our student skills did. So, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We'll see you shortly for the panel discussion as well. So, okay. thank you. Um, so next up today, um, I've got a very short video. It's from Finton House School. Um, 
and it really flows on from structuring the school day, from involving um, your your parents, from involving teachers, through getting everybody educated, from being a complete virtual school. And remember, schools have not closed. And it's what works best for you, because only you know what works best for you, your teachers and your school. So um, for a great way of engaging with parents, I'd like to introduce uh, Katie from Finton House, who's going to talk about uh, using e-portfolios, etc., to engage parents. As a primary school, one of our key areas of focus was how to engage all learners from the age of four up to the age of 11. We were also very interested in looking at what we were going to teach. We knew that English and maths would be key areas of the curriculum that we needed to focus on, but alongside those, we wanted to make sure that we delivered the broad and balanced curriculum that all our children enjoy. Achieving a balance between structure and flexibility was core to what we designed. We encouraged children to be independent as possible to free up parents who were also working from home. Supporting the teachers was also very important for us. We needed to make sure that we didn't increase their workload. Key to everything we did was focusing on everyone's well-being and maintaining a sense of school community. For remote learning, we designed a new timetable. Each day was structured around three main face-to-face -face contact points, which were the same for all year groups. Each morning, we had a let's get active physical activity for all children. English and maths were all taught via Zoom. We put together class teams to ensure a ratio of one to six, teachers working in breakout rooms, often as a carousel in Key Stage 1. As well as live sessions, we had many lessons which were delivered using Frog. To support children with this learning, we offered drop-in sessions on Zoom with either the class teacher or assistant. We also timetabled whole school wellbeing sessions, clubs and assemblies. We decided to build our remote learning using Frog as staff, pupils and parents were already familiar with the platform and it enabled us to be bold in our offering. We created a new virtually Finton area which sat alongside existing sites. Clicking on the virtually Finton tile opens up the class timetable pages. First the landing page with a daily message from the head and key general links. Each evening the dates were shown for the following day to allow pupils and parents to look ahead. Clicking on the date opens up the interactive timetable with all the links to Zoom and Frog sites that were needed for that day. There's also a shared folder for resources that required printing and a link to the ePortfolios. The page also listed any additional equipment to have ready. We also used the widget rules so that extra one-to-one -one support lessons were only visible to those involved. Clicking on a subject link takes you to the subject site automatically opening up on the most recent page. The menu on the left is either weekly or daily, depending upon the subject. Teachers were given freedom to create content suitable for the children's age and based on their own teaching style. This included videos, pre-recorded lessons, forms, polls, walls, quizzes, PDFs, external links, etc. E-portfolios were introduced to enable children to share their work with teachers. Feedback was given using the timeline and we even introduced special headmasters stickers. On our e-portfolio, children clicked on a button to notify a teacher that work had been uploaded. This automatically placed the work in the teacher's virtual marking box. To enable us to promote a sense of community and to share and celebrate work more widely, we created gallery sites visible to all staff, pupils and parents. At Finton, our extracurricular provision is outstanding and we felt it was important for the children's well-being to maintain this during lockdown. Each week there were new clubs on offer and throughout the term the club's pages were visited over 16,000 times. Each week finished with a pre-recorded assembly which focused on celebrating the staff and children's work as well as injecting an important element of fun. Did you just see that? 
I absolutely love that. I'm going to bring some of those dinosaurs into my team meeting because it's just brilliant. So next up, we have the um, panel discussion. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be welcoming this morning Sophie Bailey. Sophie is the founder of the EdTech podcast. And you were previously head of content at BET, one of the world's, well, the world's largest EdTech show. So Sophie, what we're going to do is we're going to bring the, uh, the panel on stage, so we'll have Kate, uh, Neelan Palmer from the Ashford School and Nick House is going to join us again from Greenshaw and then I'm going to disappear off. So it's probably going to take a couple of minutes to bring everybody back on screen again while we hand over to them. So how are you Sophie? Oh yes, I'm very well, thank you Lucy. Yeah, really excited to be here and I've been enjoying the chat alongside as well. So uh, welcome to everyone around the world. I've certainly noticed the chat's been absolutely full this morning. Um, lots of uh, visitors from across the world in there um, and obviously a very different uh, approach to September. So some schools going back in September, some in November I've seen, some uh, a bit unsure about what an online provision should be and some countries saying they must have an online provision even though they're going back in September. So very interesting. Um, so hi Kate, welcome back. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So I believe we're just waiting for Nick. So Nick's here and the last one will be um, Neelam when Neelam joins in. So uh, Sophie, I am going to take myself off screen now so you can maybe start with Kate and Nick and then Neelam will probably drop in when I drop out. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Lucy. Um, well, hello, everyone, again, and um, thank you to uh, Lucy and Mark for putting together this event, which I know they've uh, put a lot of work in behind the scenes. Um, and before we start the panel, just a few uh, points. The first one was just, I really wanted to say a heartfelt thank you to all of the educators uh, on this call and, and the leaders in schools, because um, you know it's easy to forget as we're going into this next phase that Kate was talking about, that um, you know, this was a huge effort and a selfless um, effort towards our children's learning. So I really wanted to say thank you. Um, so a quick introduction of myself. My name is Sophie Bailey. I'm the founder and host of the EdTech podcast. Um, our mission is to improve the dialogue between ed and tech for better innovation and impact. So we uh, quite often uh, interview school leaders um, such as we've got here today. Um, we've got 30 minutes uh, now. So I'm going to try and ask as many questions as we can to share as many insights um, from our fantastic guests. Um, but before that, a big welcome to our guests. So I'll just quickly um, go over some introductions for those people who may have joined um, after today's keynote. So uh, Nick House, uh, who's, who's with us here, um, is head teacher at Greenshaw High School. He was described apparently by Ofsted as having impressive clarity and drive, which um, I very much, uh, <laughs> I very much uh, crave um, uh, having had a lockdown baby. So uh, enjoy that, Nick. Um, Kate Ragg is deputy head teacher at the Education and Leadership Trust uh, and teacher of computing and also the Cross Trust lead on e-learning and e-safety. So a powerhouse from Manchester with us. And uh, hopefully later we'll also have uh, Neelam Palmer, who is the director of e-learning at Ashwood School. Um, Neelam's written some great blogs for us on um, implementation of EdTech. So much to Kate's point about doing a few things well rather than trying to do everything and, and, and nothing sort of working. So. Um, um, look forward to welcome, welcoming you later. But I don't know, we'll jump straight in to get as much out of this session. So my first question is to Kate. Um, Kate, uh, Wally Range, I hope I pronounced all these uh, schools correctly, is a large 11 to 18 high school of uh, 1,500 girls located in the heart of inner city Manchester. Um, one of the schools is 1,000 girls. The East Manchester Academy is a mixed school of 970 students in the heart of Manchester's regeneration area and the Education Leadership Trust serve some of the most deprived wards in Manchester and some of the most culturally diverse with over 90% of sixth form students from ethnic minority backgrounds. So um, my question here was, um, first of all, that's a lot of students and a lot of individual needs. 
Um, and, you know, it will be no surprise to many people uh, listening in that school budgets are strapped. So I just wondered how you went about, um, you know, considering the investments, if there are any investments that needed to be made when you were sort of um, tackling this challenge or whether you used existing tech. And that isn't necessarily investments in the monetary sense, but more where did you focus your attention, whether it's on teacher training or implementing new technology to, um, you know, tackle that complex problem, uh, essentially. Um, hi, hello. Thank mm -hmm. you, Sophie. Um, well, quite a few bits to unpick there, I think, really. Uh, in terms of the tech, um, yes, there are shrinking budgets. I have to say the executive head and the head teachers at the Education Leadership Trust have been amazing and trying to protect a lot of the tech budget as far as we can um, over the last few years. So actually, the tech was all in place. One of the things that we found was that the staff, not all the staff knew how to use it properly. And that was the biggest thing for us. So we actually had the platforms. We had all of the connectivity that we needed. Um, the biggie for us was that although a lot of the students have mobile phones, and in fact, in two of our schools, the students are on the Wi-Fi uh, and are encouraged to bring their phones into school as long as they connect to the Wi-Fi, which is filtered. Um, obviously, we ran into problems when it came to um, students accessing devices, and we, we, we've lent out just about every single mobile device we've got. We've virtually stripped the schools in terms of lending those out. I'm in the process of trying to get them all back at the moment, which is my August challenge. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that is a biggie. We, we, we had devices that came through from the DfE, 136 devices across 3,500 children, so yeah. that didn't go very far. We've worked with local charities, we've worked with um, the, the local authority. We're just trying everything that we can, really, to, to try and get as many devices out there as possible. That's one of the reasons why we want to do another tech survey in September, because, um, you know, even though we'd lent devices to households, we discovered perhaps that one household might have five children using one computer. So when we set up the timetable, one of the big challenges for us was not to have a timed timetable, because the students could be accessing it depending on when they're um, time slot with the device was and so we we did um, a very similar timetable to the one that um, Nick showed earlier and ours were called sessions and there were, there were hyperlinked through but there was no prescriptive time the only time that was prescriptive was when there were some um, live uh, lessons via audio some via video but they they were at drop-in points in the week they weren't Specifically, it's Tuesday, it's 10 o'clock. If you do business studies, you've got to be here. We ran as many drop-in points as we can to offer access, but it is a big challenge. Yeah, um, that's that's a really interesting point about, you know, not, not having that luxury necessarily to have the whole whole day laid out. Um, and I loved your point about making it bite-sized. So one, one thing that I experienced um, when I was doing the, the whole homeschooling thing was, the information that we were receiving was in a kind of week block, um, you know, everything that you were going to do across the whole week. And I had this conversation with someone that the, the way it was written was more because teachers are used to communicating to perhaps a supply teacher. And so it was kind of written out. And as a parent, that could be sometimes quite overwhelming to try and unpick, OK, what, what am I doing? And yeah, I like the quite, quite point. Were you offered something half term six, week three? You know, one of those, every time I saw that bit on the screen, it just made my heart sink because I thought the children don't know it's half term six, week three. They might know it's the, the 8th, 8th of July, but they don't know about weeks and timings. So I think that that was, and that consistency of things is really important. Interestingly, you said about the about the shorter bursts as well. I mean, we, we went through a very steep learning curve in terms of um, learning how to um, record, store video uh, footage if we were videoing lessons or videoing narrated PowerPoints and the buffering and people were saying, well, I've put my lesson together. I said, yeah, but it's 20 minutes long. And actually the children are, are quite used to a, a 15 second TikTok culture. They're not gonna sit there for 20 minutes while you're buffering. So we, we, we did learn an awful lot about keeping things short and keeping things in small blocks. Um, 
for management really all round, not just uh, not just for the teachers, but for the children and the parents. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you, Kate. I'll, I'll come back to you in just a moment. Uh, I had a question for Neelam, but um, we'll, we'll come back to that one. Um, so, so Nick, my question to you is, um, your school, if I understand correctly, is a large mixed comprehensive and a highly selective outer London borough. Um, as I'm sure you will have noticed, um, assessment is a hot topic right now. Um, so I was keen to find out how your school managed to continue uh, assessing students remotely and whether there's any learnings that we could take from this approach uh, on, a, on a sort of more macro level with everything that's going on in the exam crisis right now. Yeah, I mean, so one of our things that I'm really proud of is we're also a research school. Um, so we were identified by the EEF as having some skills and knowledge and being a useful school to work with other schools across South London and the South East. Um, and that means when you talk to me about things like assessment, I'm going to get really fussy and really detailed and pedantic about it. Um, so assessment means lots of different things to lots of different people. In our school, we're really, really clear that enormous amounts of teacher marking is not assessment. Um, it's feedback but where we want to assess we want to really know what young people have understood and what they can do mm -hmm. um, and I think if I'm absolutely honest over the summer term our greatest focus was not on assessment um, I think we were quite clear that the nature of learning in a remote situation was going to be profoundly different mm -hmm. um, I did say in my presentation that where pupils returned work we sampled their work so if we had a class of 30 pupils we asked our teachers to maintain a mark book and make sure that they had sampled work from five to six students in a class of 30 and they were different five to six pupils each time um, and then we would give general formative feedback to those pupils so these seem to be some of the misconceptions this is the kind of thing that we think we might need to return to as a group in terms of pure assessment um, I think there are so many complicating factors we're assessing for learning and to know where the kids are at we're not assessing as a summative activity because you don't know how long they spent on a task what other external resources they might have used online typically um, so I think the notion of assessment is actually really complex I think if I'm also serious the biggest area we sought to assess was kids well-being Mm -hmm. and that's incredibly difficult online so you use proxies like engagement rates so how frequently are people logging on how frequently are they turning and work um and i genuinely and i'm happy to say as a national state paid dfe head teacher um that the biggest thing i was assessing for our young people was engagement rates connectedness and just being in the game um and i think that's the most important thing we assessed Absolutely. And I'm, I'm really pleased to hear you say that. because one of my big concerns was less the academic side for my son. It was more the socialisation and him sort of being stuck here on his own um, was a bit concerning. Um, and I loved your point on familiar, familiarity. Um, we had a past guest on the podcast before called Ted Fujimoto, and he talks about school reform and he talks about relationships, relevance and rigour. So this idea that actually the underpinnings of some of these things are actually quite boring. It's just, you know, making is the consistency, um, which isn't very um, glamorous, but but is what kind of gets things done as well. Um, but on the note of familiarity, before I move on, um, when our son came back, uh, I was one of those parents that thought, OK, keep your school uniform on because, you know, then uh, you'll feel like you're, do you're doing your school schoolwork and everything. And strangely, when he went back to school, they didn't have to wear school uniforms. So that's the kind mm. of uh, topsy-turvy world we, we live in at the moment. Um, I think my, my sense of familiarity and routine has changed massively. I think when I was naive and a young teacher and didn't quite know what I know now, um, I thought that teenagers should be quite adaptable and flexible because the world, as I saw it, was messy and complex and unpredictable. So therefore, why shouldn't teenagers be able to get one sort of lesson in history and a different sort of lesson in French? Um, and now, as I'm also a parent of a teenager myself and a little bit older, I know that teenagers, particularly talking to secondary colleagues in this meeting, um, they've got a heck of a lot of change going on in their lives already um, around their own identity, around their emerging sense of self. Um, so to actually to have some familiarity and routine is really reassuring. 
yeah, it is quite dull. Um, and yes, it's not some super breakthrough research PhD, um, but I think it's incredibly secure and helps young people feel stable and feel familiar. Um, and I think teenagers need that as much as anything we can offer them, whether that's in the school or online. Absolutely. We, we did an episode before on self-directed learning and um, the, the, the question there was, you know, if teenagers don't have their prefrontal cortex completely developed, you know, are they actually capable of, of um, doing all the things that we would expect out of self-directed learning? And some, so perhaps sometimes that's a bit of a big ask. Um, so another question for Kate. Um, your responsibilities at ELT also cover e-learning and e-safety. Um, and we've heard on the podcast about terrible sort of safeguarding incidents during COVID, um, uh, as well as the sort of much documented attainment gaps um, expanding um, due to the digital divide. And you may have covered some of this in your, in your last answer, but um, what's, this, what's been your school's approach to these problems and how can tech be used to ha perhaps sort of tackle some of them as well, if it, if it can indeed? Yeah, uh, that was one of the things that really uh, worried me, actually. Safeguarding uh, has to trump everything, really, in terms in schools. And one of the things that worried me about the DFE offer, as wonderful as it was, and there were lots of other offers from companies about lending kit, um, I actually asked somebody um, at the DFE in a phone call to them and said, can you just tell me though you're offering these webcam enabled devices with internet dongles to the families who've got the least experience in terms of using these sorts of things safely well you know just generally from a work point of view as well as the safety point of view um you know what what safeguarding points are you actually going to put in there and i think that in the end they did actually put in some web filtering but I have to say, we have got some absolutely gifted um, technicians here, and my infrastructure manager is amazing. I managed to work out a way so that every device that we lent still went through all of our filters, uh, and we ha actually have some um, software on uh, computers, laptops as well, that, that do tracking. And that's true whether you're a, a brand new year seven or the executive head teacher, the same safeguarding software is on every single device in the school. Um, nobody's left out of that, that particular um, bubble, as it were. That's the other reason why we want our students on our Wi-Fi rather than on data plans. You know, we find very often parents come in and they say, oh, my child from X, Y, and Z on the internet, but it turns out they've got an unlimited data contract. And actually, if they were on our Wi-Fi, they wouldn't be able to get to a lot of the things that are there. Um, yeah. I suppose overall, you know, one of the subjects in our timetable as well was um, test and tip and PSHRE and PPC, and we pushed an essential message out there every single week, but I don't know if the experience is the same thing as the school, but the number of children who end up putting their easily in tears in my office saying, I know I shouldn't have, but I did. <laughs> It, 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 it's a really hard, really hard message to get across. I mean, two things that strike me about teenagers, interesting what Nick was saying about, about teenagers. The other thing is a lot of people say, oh, teenagers use their mobile phones, they know what they're doing. But actually, a lot of teenagers don't know what they're doing with their mobile phones. They're really good at doing one or two small jobs, but they're not tech geeks. They're not forward thinking in terms of the damage that they might do. They're not, um, they're not experienced enough, I suppose, to understand how important this impact is going to be on their life. I've spent just as much time during lockdown emailing Instagram, emailing some of the big companies, asking them to take down posts, asking them to take down fake accounts. Um, and we just keep trying. We keep putting the message out there and we keep supporting the students and the staff when problems occur. But I would like to see some of the conversation change so that government are actually talking to some of these big social media companies. At the moment, if you're dealing with an issue with a young person on a social um, media platform, it's almost impossible to make headway with them. Um, they're, they're faceless sort of black holes that take emails and um, they just don't respond no matter what you say. And I, I would like to see government tackling some of the big social media companies 
alongside some of the digital divide. Other than that, we just keep going with the lessons. We keep going, and more than anything else, we talk and we report. We were doing weekly uh, contact, phone contact with all of our students as well to make sure that they were okay. Yeah, I, lo I love the idea. It's such a simple idea, and I, and I know when you scale that up, it's a lot of work. But the you know calling calling people individually, whether you know on their birthdays or other moments to check in, is is massive. And I know I have friends that that have have been doing that, and um, you know the work involved. Um, so I know Neelam um, hasn't been able to make it, but one point she made on a previous podcast was um, that in this age of remote learning, um, sort of the, the the teachers that haven't perhaps um put, you know where lessons aren't engaging there's nowhere to hide because of the data that you've mentioned that you can collect in terms of perhaps uh, people logging in and that kind of thing so through looking at some of the back ends of these platforms have you been able to you know redesign some of your lessons or sort of iterate what you're doing and have you got any lessons to share with people that are watching or listening in about you know, you talked about earlier making things smaller. If there's anything else like that that you'd like to share, that would be great as well. So one of the things that we, all of us were stepping into a slightly unknown world. And I think there are companies whose raison d'etre is online learning. So if you think about somebody like a maths provider, like Hegarty Maths, for example, um, they've learned this stuff, they've done this stuff, and they've gone through this a number of iterations. Um, schools do not have individual expertise to yeah. be able either to create the, the platform and the infrastructure or the pedagogy and the really known things that hook kids in. There are things about the way that Hegarty is designed that are really smart. There are things about the way Tassamai, the science quizzing platform is designed that are really smart. Um, so we had to stumble and we had to make sense about what we were doing. One of the really, really good things was we went back to things like principles around teaching and learning. So the notion of what we call dual coding, that language, whether that's heard speech, um, should be backed up by visual representation. So an image on the screen should help reinforce the understanding um, that the young person gets of what's being said. Um, and we looked at some of our earlier slides um, and mostly staff were talking with slides in the background um, and they were just really confusing. They were cluttered, they were overloaded, they were badly designed. Um, and so we managed to do some insects. We did some staff training in virtual meetings in May and June and gave some examples of some really brilliantly designed slides um, and said, this will help learning. Fundamentally, this will help really difficult concepts stick. And if we think it's difficult to teach difficult content when you've got an adult in the room that you can ask questions of, then amplify that by how difficult it is to learn in a remote setting. Um, so that's one example of something that we learned about, not our lesson design so much, more of our resource design um, and being able to take pictures and images of our most gifted teachers' resources and then share them with other people and say, we can all do this stuff if you really carefully think about it. Um, and we've now got resources that will be good for time. So if we didn't have a lockdown for the rest of this school year, some of those resources would actually be revision resources and things we can start creating into a library of ongoing curriculum resources, um, especially where they've been really well designed and they're really fit for purpose. So yeah, there's an example of something that we've altered as we've gone. Fantastic, thanks Nick. Um, Kate, do you have anything to add or? Yeah, um, very similar actually. One of the um, examples I was going to give was GCSE pod who um, had, we were setting some assignments, um, little things like a, a key question, which might be a multiple choice question, where, again, they've done so much thinking, you know, just to reiterate what Nick says, they've done a huge amount of planning and work behind the scenes. So they'll ask a question, which is a very, on, on the face of it, a relatively simple um, multiple choice question where the right answer is obviously the right answer, but the wrong answers all pick up key misconceptions. They're not just randomly put in there, they're actually put in there to test if a misconception has occurred, so that if the child actually gets the answer wrong, it can then lead them on to, well, you've given that answer. See if Kate that comes back. Oh. <laughs> so Nick, it's, uh, oh, there we go, you're back. Sorry. Yeah. So um, I think that's, you know, Nick was talking about assessment earlier and really good quality assessment has to be crafted and it takes time to do that. You can't write something very quickly 
you know, and, and really make sure that it gets to the nub of, of what you want to do. So that's why we've done an awful lot of sharing as well. So where people have put together questions, where they've put together lessons, where they've put together resources, where they've put together videos, with they, they've shared, um, talked to the students, we've had staff sitting in with each other. Um, when we started doing the, the live lessons, the staff sat in with each other, partly for a bit of solidarity, but also partly to learn how to do things with each other. They were absolutely fantastic. And the same thing about the slides, and, and as I said in my presentation, the thought of having a very densely packed slide on a very small phone screen was just something that was that was a no-no. So you might have noticed my slides, you know, it's just a single big image where we'd already been doing quite a lot of work on, on dual coding, and particularly for our students, cognitive overload was a real, really big um, driver before lockdown. So when lockdown started, we were talking to staff about actually doing simpler screens and narrated PowerPoints and not having yourself appearing as a little person in the bottom of the screen because that, that splits the attention of the students and becomes quite confusing. It's better to have a narrated PowerPoint with really simple points and leave pauses in there or even have a slide pause for 10 minutes and reflect on this. You don't really wait for 10 minutes, otherwise your video buffers. But it's, you know, actually there were key points where we actually even had slides to tell children to stop and think um, and actually do some reflecting before they moved on to the next bit. It's it's been a it's been a development of our teaching and learning. It's not new, but it's developed it very rapidly in a way that we were hoping to go. It's just developed it in a uh, you know in a different time scale for us. Brilliant. So, well, thank you so much. Um, I was going to ask one more question, but we've run out of time. But perhaps you can pop it in the in the chat, which would be you know we often talk about what you what we add to make uh, teachers workload less, um, and and perhaps what we can do is um, have a think about one thing that you would take away. But I'll I'll leave you to add that in the chat, and um, otherwise I will get told off by Lucy. And um, both of you, thank you so much for adding um, a bit of extra insight with this uh, discussion, and thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you guys. Nice to see you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Kate. Um, thanks again, Sophie. Uh, Neelam does pass on her apologies. So um, we have come to the end of the first section. Um, after the break, we'll be bringing on stage Bookie Youssef uh, and her experiences uh, across many schools. So Bookie's not from a frog school at all, but she's got lots of great insights to bring. And we've got some more speakers. Hi everyone and welcome back. So um, I hope you enjoyed the first part of today. This next section is uh, started off with um, a lady called Buki Yusuf. Now Buki has had over 20 years experience in the EdTech, uh, in, in teaching, sorry, and is, a pas is passionate about education technology, uh, especially schools having a digital strategy in place and has got lots of experience from many other educators that I know she's going to bring to uh, to the event today. So, hi, Bookie, how are you? Hi, Lucy, I'm fine, thank you. You all right? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. Through the uh, initial morning nerves, and now we're, we're chugging away, so it's all going very well. So I'm going to come off screen now and hand straight over to you. Okay, thank you okay. so much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everyone, no matter where you are in the world. It's lovely to be here. And thank you, Lucy and Mark, for facilitating this event. Um, as you can see from my title, I'm going to be talking about the distance, the positives of distance learning. And I'll start off with this image. This image will now forever be linked 2020, COVID-19 and the pandemic it actually led to. So no matter where we are, where, no matter where we presently are in the world, where we work within state schools, independent schools, we were all completely taken by surprise when things change in terms of teaching and learning from what we're used to in terms of teaching within a classroom setting, a school setting with our students, and this concept of online learning. 
So no matter whether you use the term online learning, remote learning, distance learning, many teachers felt as you see depicted in this image in relation to this particular term because it was moving completely away from what we were actually used to. Yet, Teacher Tap. So Teacher Tap is a service within the UK that undertakes surveys every single day with teachers across the UK by posing three questions. And at the beginning of August, they pose this particular question. And over 90 percent of the educators, there are 8000 educators approximately that answered, responded that they were proud in varying degrees of the support that schools provided for the students during lockdown. And this implicitly links to the distance learning and the use of edtech. So obviously, I'm going to be focusing on positives, but from a slightly unique perspective. I'm going to be doing it from the perspective of my school, as well as sharing some examples of educators, I'm sure that will resonate with your own circumstance, no matter where you are in actual world. So to explain about my school, it is a special school. So every single student actually has complex learning needs and they have an EHCP and it's also alternative provision. And by that, it means that every one of our students, every single student, every child, has actually been out of formal education, mainstream education for varying degrees of time, at least about six to nine months, and the most extensive three years being out of mainstream schooling. And because of that context, we only have about 15 students who are aged from 14 to 19 years old, and they are taught in a one-to-one -one context. And I'll be honest and put my hand up and say, when we could actually see lockdown looming and going to distance learning, I was worried. I was thinking, how are we going to make it work? Because those of our students are tactile learners, so they need to actually have the physical resources to actually aid their learning and also to be guided through with the support of teachers or an additional, learning, uh, um, additional adult in the class. But I'm going to share the positives of how we actually made it work in four different contexts. So the first context is, uh, the communications, regular contact and clear communication channels. And they were in all of these regards, formal, informal and unofficial. The relevant staff members. So we have key members within our school who are the only ones that can be in contact with our families, whether they're the parents, carers or guardians of our students. And they will ask a few basic questions. First of all, how are you looking at how they were and understanding the context in which they were actually operating within so that we understood and made no assumptions. And then we ask, what technology do you actually have at home? And they were very open and honest because they could see from the get go that we were there to support them and to support them during this challenge and also support them to do the distance learning that we undertook we got some very honest answers. So we had a clear idea about what was actually in place. With staff, there were regular communication. So we had daily briefings, both in the morning and in the afternoon. In the morning to set things up so we could actually see what we're going to be teaching, the students we were actually engaging with, and a reminder to note any concerns or note any positives that we actually saw in what we called our COVID-19 log, a Google spreadsheet just to act, um, a log things so that if there are any issues we need to act upon, we could actually do that. We had regular staff updates of key aspects. So obviously changes within the government and also if there were any things that we actually heard that may actually impact upon the learning of the students, we actually kept abreast of that as well as staff discussions. Now we had WhatsApp groups, so there were frequent and informal communications. If we needed to get messages shared, this is how we actually did it. Mindful of we were about the fact that there were some concerns at the very beginning about WhatsApp and privacy, so we never ever used any students' names, but we still made sure that the communication flow was there. We used the Zoom meetings and also phone phone calls where necessary if things were emergency and we actually had to get in contact. Now, this provided us a strong foundation of communication, which was open, transparent, flexible and fast between the staff, our students, parents, carers and guardians and the wider school communication. And this facilitated the distance learning that we wanted to undertake. Now, the second aspect that we had to consider, and we actually got some positives, were the teaching and learning. As I said to you from the, uh, the very beginning, our context was, is unique because a lot of the resources, they have to be hands on for our students. We had to learn really quickly. 
We knew from the honest and open conversations that many of our students, our young people and their families only had access to the internet and the learning resources through mobiles. So we had to be proactive and think how we're going to make it work. But it worked really well for our practical subjects. So where we had subjects that were actually helping students to develop particular skills, say for example, like cooking, we were able to do this through the mobile, but we'd also reminded parents about the fact that not only should you keep your children safe, and we shared this with e-learning guides we want to remind them whenever we actually take um, lessons through the mobile you have to be there to support and at, at that and reinforce the safeguarding aspects but our staff rose the challenge prior to the lockdown I'll be honest and say not many of us actually used edtech or any form of technology to actually aid the teaching but we we learned quickly so we use predominantly Google Classroom to actually share and upload resources for our students Google Meet Zoom, as well as WhatsApp. Again, with key staff actually facilitating the phone calls, the video phone calls, so that facilitated the relevant lessons where it was actually necessary. In addition to this, in terms of the flexible teaching and learning, we still continued with our um, professional development. They were from an external basis. So things that we were actually learning, it was really positive to see a lot of free CPD being offered around the UK and even around the world that we could actually bring into our schools and bring into the lessons that we we're actually trying to deliver and also share key messages with staff. In-house though, we actually offered, as Kate Rad said, bite-sized training opportunities. So no more than five minutes and very practical. So for example, how to include audio within your PowerPoints that could actually aid the learning. But what was even more magical is that even through this virtual space, we were able to undertake good practice, share good practice. One of our staff members that teaches students with global learning delays actually showed the PowerPoint that she used from beginning to end that enabled them to continue with their learning in a meaningful way. And we could actually celebrate that and actually view it in ways we hadn't quite been able to do before. But it also reminded us that with regards to distance learning, teachers are also learners and we did that in abundance. But the wow moments, the power was the fact that where we saw some students who maybe were quite passive in their learning through the virtual environment, they thrive, they learned. So the Google Classroom, at the beginning of the week, we actually set our learning activities and learning resources for students. And some of our students were able to engage with that and actually work to the breadth and depth at their own pace. We saw some students who were completely change from being passive learners to independent learners. Many of our students had accelerated project progress within the context of a distance learning. We could see improvements in their learning, which was heartening and showed us that we were doing the right things. But equally, because of our flexible approach, it facilitated high levels of engagement. The third aspect that we actually had positives in were regards to marking and feedback adaptations. So like many other schools, we have a marking and feedback policy, but we streamlined it just to remove the complexity and made sure that students were clear about what they had to do to three concepts. So any feedback that we gave in writing or orally focused on these three aspects, what was done well, what they needed to improve and specific actions to implement, which, were re which was really powerful because where our students struggled with home learning, maybe because of the fact that they, because they've been out of school, they hadn't actually established the homework routines, we were able to use the lesson time online to actually get them to action things. So they could see wh how their learning had actually adapted by updating information and the learning points. And that worked even within, say for example, with art lessons where everything was actually visual and through, um, through say WhatsApp videos and things like that, even to emails. Some of our students did not like to be on the video. They did not want to be seen, but they still were want, waiting, to, uh, ready to actually learn. And so for example, this email screen um, is an example of an email that I sent to pupil that still enabled the child to actually get feedback upon what they actually learned. Now the fourth aspect is by all my means, even though it's the last aspect of the four I'm going to be sharing, it is the most important the mental health and well-being focus that basically threaded through everything because of a quote that my head teacher shared at the very beginning of the lockdown experience and she said this we have to take care of ourselves in order to be in a good position to take care of our students 
And that basically meant the same questions that were being asked to our school community, our parents, carers and guardians. How are you? How are things with your family? How are the things with your, in, within your context? Meant that we as a team were able to support each other and put things in place as and when need be. But we also did this in a number of different ways. As um, had been mentioned earlier today uh, by Nick, we had a Friday focus for well-being, which undertook a number of different things, including the celebrations of birthdays and any positive news that we experienced. But furthermore, we had quizzes for Kahoot to review our learning and also to just see how it worked in action. We even played games like Stop the Bus, and you can see by my face, I'd never encountered this before, but it was, it was quite um, an interesting experience that actually enabled us to take our mind off the serious aspects we were actually counting. And also one memorable aspect where we had our art teacher leading uh, the morning and actually asking us to bring a piece of art that meant something to us. And through that activity, it enabled us to learn each other. We had frequent opportunities to laugh together as a team. And this fostered an even more of a cohesive team that uh, were trying to do the very, very best for the young people that we actually serve. Now, in addition to that, I just wanted to share a couple of um, stories from other educators that I'd encountered during the lockdown period. Myself and Mark Anderson, we actually have a Friday evening during a term time session for an hour called UK Edge Stories, and it's looking at the positives. Despite all the challenges that are out there, we were actually actively looking for the positives. So you have Michelle Grant, who was one of our guests um, earlier on. She appeared in April. She's a year four primary teacher who shares some of the ways in which she actually enabled, enabled the students as well as herself to maintain a relationship, even though they weren't um, actually speaking from a physical, um, from a virtual context. She also made sure that she communicated by email so that the parents could actually access it, but she made sure to take care in sharing how proud she was of what the children were actually trying to do during this unusual context and made sure that she provided feedback to the parents to give them assurance because she knew that many of them were really worried about doing the right things and were worried about whether or not they were supporting the home learning of their children. She made sure that she took time to do this. We have another educator, Michael, geography head of department, who spoke about how he undertakes assessments and he spoke about using low stake um, assessments to minimise the anxiety that students might actually have around assessments to enable, the, enable them to review their learning. He talks about, spoke about how the fact that because these uh, assessments help the students to build their confidence, they were more willing to engage. But he also did explain about the fact that this basically was the continuation of some of the practices they actually did within the school environment. So it was great to actually continue this on a virtual basis. And he also spoke about how some of the feedback practices that they undertook within his school also helped to minimise workload, particularly if they were actually providing her, um, whole class feedback, looking at misconceptions, common next steps, etc. Another positive that I learned through many discussions um, with educators within the UK and around the world is the fact that EdTech the distance learning provides a lever to really highlight your core values. So where you've got these particular core values within a school context, as I found within my school, it was still being exemplified. And that was something that was very surprising, but heartening to actually see. And I'll end by actually sharing some key messages that I think we can all actually resonate with. We actually are flexible in our approaches as educators, no matter where we are, and we are doing the very, very best for our students, even if we were learning through mistakes. I actually tend to see, don't see them as actually mistakes, but actually finding what worked for our students. And there was actually no shame or anything like this. Everyone was actually being proactive and solution focused. We operated as a cohesive unit, and this is me having to give thanks to the head teachers all around the world for actually stepping up and taking the challenge to do the very, very, very best by their school community during these challenging times.
And here's an example that I saw on LinkedIn. Elroy Kaohio, King's head teacher of Kingsley Academy, shared this Ofsted mock-up that his year 11 students had actually drawn up to show that he was an outstanding head teacher. They appreciated what the school actually did, but in re relation particularly for the coronavirus planning. And I think being shared ahead of our GCCs is something that is really important. So my question to you is, where can you find examples of positive, um, uh, positive distance learning? What I call those memory making moments. You can see by my face, I'm still engaged, I'm still smiling, in memory of what we experience as the course Q community, in spite of the backdrop that we're operating against. And even if it means that on some days and some weeks, you have to look long and hard, find those find those, celebrate them, and share them with your school and the wider community as well. Thank you so much. So, uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And thank you for giving a nod as well to all of the head teachers across the globe who are also um, being so adaptable and, as you say, flexible and thinking about the small things like you did, like making it work on mobile devices, um, making sure teachers were prepared. And uh, I love that you said you laugh together as a team. That's just superb. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lucy. Thank you. Right. Um, so, so next up, we have a, a, a short video from Over the Seas in Paris. So we have the British School of Paris who have taken every single lesson online. And I'm really, really pleased that Keith Perry has put together this video for us. And uh, as if by magic, my colleagues will make it appear for me. Hi everybody, thank you for taking the time to listen to this uh, short presentation, um, it's much appreciated. I want to talk to you a little bit about how the British School of Paris approached remote learning um, and accept that this was for us a new way of teaching and learning, um, something that we need to ensure that we embraced and be aware that it's something we're going to have to do in the future as well. So what's going to follow now is how we responded as a school. And I'm, I'm pleased to be able to tell you that we were able to deliver lessons on day one of confinement. A full programme from nursery through to year 13. Every single lesson, lesson by lesson. We didn't break the day up in any other way. We stuck to a timetable. At the senior school, that's an 11 period day and we delivered 11 sessions per day. At the junior school, they operate on a different format, but they delivered their lessons every day. Um, I hope you enjoy what you see next. I hope it gives you a, a clear insight into what we did. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you did at schools to see how that might impact the work we're going to be doing. We're already planning for the future and you'll see within my presentation how we plan, hope to move on the system we currently have into a new system and a new way of delivering resources to our pupils. Thank you, thank you for listening and um, I hope the day goes well. Good morning, my group. This is your final spelling test of year one. Hooray! So hope everybody gets 10 out of 10 on this one. Okay, so I hope you've written down numbers one to 10 and the date. Here we go. Number one, hungry.
We need to do handwriting. So this one we're going to look at L E at the end. So we have little, tall L, small I. And it's funny we've got one, two. That's the two at two T's, and then an L, and then an E. Now does that look? Okay, let's read the question carefully. Harry is reading a book of 48 pages. He reads four pages a day. How long will it take him to finish the book? Okay. So Thank you very much to Keith for putting together that video. As you can see on the chat, you're all agreeing that really there has been an awful lot of work that's put into that. And the school truly have become a virtual school. And in the words of Keith, this has become a new way of teaching and learning. So next we have um, a good friend of ours, uh, Nikki Taylor from um, Spain this time. Now every year Nikki travels to our conference. She's never spoken, she's never been ready to do that. But actually this year, uh, Nikki put together a short presentation uh, for you all and uh, I'd like to share that with you now. So over to Nikki Taylor from Oak House in Barcelona. Hi, I'm Nikki Taylor. I'm the head of primary at Oak House School in Barcelona. The majority of our students are native Spanish speakers and we teach the English national curriculum with the addition of formal lessons in Spanish and Catalan from year two upwards. We've been using Frogging Primary as our learning platform for four years, so all our students, their families and our teachers were already familiar with it before the school closure this March. 
That familiarity meant the transition to using Frog as our central hub for home learning much, it was much easier. Since we had so little time to prepare for home learning, we wanted to avoid overwhelming the students and the teachers with new technologies, which would have made the situation even more challenging. The teachers had daily online classes with students, which in combination with the resources posted on Frog, meant students were able to continue with their learning from home throughout the lockdown. This was our approach throughout primary, no matter what age the students were. We decided that each year group would develop a home learning site. Initially, the sites were quite simple, but once the situation of home learning was going to go on for a lot longer, we were able to build on them. Each year group worked together in their team to develop their sites. They were able to upload material, working together from their homes, accessing the content before it went live to students. This was one of the benefits of FROG, as it enabled teachers to continue collaborating together at a distance to plan the learning. Although the teachers were understandably worried about how they and the students would manage remote learning, they quickly acquired new skills and gained confidence building up the sites. Each year group had a FROG leader who was able to support less confident colleagues and non-English speaking teachers also built the sites easily. I'll show you some of the year group sites so you can see how the teachers use the FROG. This is the year one site. You can see that it's organised into weeks. The students could click on the day and see the resources, messages and instructions. It was really important that the students continued with the phonics programme, so the teachers created short videos. The children were able to see their teachers each day and the videos kept the same lesson structure that they were used to. Frog gave families the flexibility to access the resources at a time that was convenient to them. Not all children had access to a device at all times of the day and parents were having to juggle the demands of supporting their children and working from home. They really appreciated this flexibility. Frog also encouraged independent learning because the children could watch the videos multiple times and could go back to them if they weren't sure. This was particularly helpful for the less able children. It was very easy to adapt the sites to engage the children according to their age. Each year group customised their site to make it attractive and easy to use for their year group. The teachers had daily Google Meet sessions with their classes and were able to teach the children using activities and resources posted by sharing their frog screen. A combination of these approaches meant that all children could engage with their learning, even if they couldn't attend the Google Meets. This is the Year 6 home learning site. The older children had more online Google Meet sessions, but the Frog platform was still the main tool and reflected what was being taught in the online lesson. All the lesson resources such as PowerPoints, videos, audios, texts were on the sites. You'll see that in Year 6, the teachers set up different subject sites the students were able to upload their work using assignment tools or through their Google Drives and shared folders for the teachers to feed back on. The ease with which the a range of resources could be uploaded onto Frog is great for our ESL learners who benefit hugely from having visual resources to improve their understanding. Frog also lends itself to the flipped learning model as teachers could post resources and ask students to look at them before discussing them in the online lesson sessions. We also uploaded videos and audios of teachers reading stories and posted daily family challenges and children were invited to upload photos, videos and audios too. We found the site timeline really useful as it meant the children could share with others and comment on each other's posts in a safe environment. Frog was able to help us keep children motivated with competitions, quizzes and reward systems. We even moved our house point system onto Frog. The technical support team at Frog gave me useful advice on how to adapt the platform to our needs throughout. In addition to learning, it was important to us that the children were able to continue to experience some of the fun things we organise at school. For example, we moved our end of year talent show onto Frog, with children uploading videos of themselves showcasing their talents. Another priority for us was to maintain the pastoral care that we give the students and to extend that to our families. We extended the parent portal that we had already created into a family wellbeing page. Being able to build up the sites from scratch allowed us to share information and advice for parents in both languages. Families were also invited to share photos of things they enjoyed during lockdown using the site timeline. To help students stay active, our PE teachers did streamed lessons linked through Frog and children shared photographs of themselves completing the challenges. 
Although it was a lot of work moving on to the remote, remote learning situation, one of the great things is that all the resources that were made during this period are saved and can be accessed easily and used again. And the skills learned during this period will ensure that our use of Frog will continue to grow to support students' learning in the future. Nikki, that is fantastic. Um, it would, I'm, I'm really pleased that you shared that with us. There's so much there, but not just about teaching and learning. As Nikki talked about, it was around uh, connecting families and family challenges, but also recognising that children are isolated and children do well when they're connected to each other. So she's enabled that through her platform, which is absolutely fantastic. So thank you again, Nikki, for sharing your story. Um, next up is John Parsons from the Winston Churchill School. Now, John has been with Frog for many years, but actually the period at the beginning of lockdown in March, he spent a lot of time with his senior leadership team and heads of departments, making sure that the curriculum was mapped to the resources that they actually had. And actually, I'm going to probably steal a bit of his thunder, so I'll, I will let John talk. But one of the things he does say is the skill of learning without a teacher requires practice. So with that in mind, I'm going to hand over to John. Thank you very much, Lucy. The Winston Churchill School where I work is a state-run secondary school. It's 1,500 students strong and we have no sixth form. Uh, we're based in Surrey. My job is assistant head teacher in charge of teaching and learning and therefore online learning. Uh, it's a very brief presentation so some of the things I say are very generalised and that might be irksome. I apologise for that. Now, at Winston, the thing that's most relevant to this discussion that we do is we try and enable students to become as autonomous as possible. And we're going to talk a bit about how we are trying to learn how technology can support that autonomy. So the last few months have been very revealing. Before we got locked down, we had a meeting and we talked about uh, this being uh, actually an incredible opportunity for us to learn a lot ourselves about online learning. Now, at the time, we sort of identified what we were going to look at. But in retrospect, this is how I would phrase the three questions that we set ourselves. One, uh, what happens when you remove the teacher from the learning environment? The second thing is, how should we structure our online learning resources to capture students in their moment of engagement? And three, what skills do we now know we need to focus on in school to effectively increase student autonomy? So this presentation is what we learned and how it has changed our approach to online learning as a support for normal human interactive learning. I've organised it into two strands. One is what kind of resources do we need to provide? And the other is what things do teachers provide in the classroom that students rely on? And how do we provide those in an online environment? So the first strand, and remember I'm talking about this from a leadership point of view, is we can't just fill our online provision with classroom resources. They're designed for a very different purpose and a very different environment. Although we already had quite a, a substantial online curriculum available to students, when we got locked down, uh, it's completely understandable that what teachers did was use classroom resources to provide opportunities for students to learn at home. So now I'm going to explain what we learned from this. First of all, I hope we all agree that to be successful, the student has to be a motivated learner. We spend a lot of our time creating, engaging and motivating ways for students to do the work we ask them to do. So when we are doing our classroom planning, either in the back or the front of our mind, we are thinking about the students who don't want to do the work and how we can engage them. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to do a classic teacher analogy to drive home my point. So I have decided as a teacher that you will buy and build a bookcase. I take you to Ikea at a time of my choosing and make you buy a flat pack bookcase, which I have to choose because you refuse to choose one. I then take you home, hand you the instructions and stare at you whilst you try everything in your power to avoid assembling it. So how do I get you to do it? Option A, cut the instructions up into a fun jigsaw or option B, threaten you with the bookshelf police. That is the situation we have in the back of our mind when we plan for the classroom. In contrast, the motivated learner wants or needs a bookcase. So they go to IKEA willingly, 
choose a flat back bookcase and buy it. They come home, open it, and there are the instructions. Now they can use the instructions or they can ignore the instructions. They have a choice. Cutting the instructions up into a jigsaw or threatening them is not going to be helpful. So in looking at and analyzing why students weren't engaged in some of the things that were online, we talked to them and they said, well, we just want to get on with it. And so I think in summary, I think we can broadly consider that the act of a student opening an online task is the point at which they are or have the potential to be a motivated learner. And therefore, we are not trying to create motivation in the task that we set. We have to assume that they are in that moment and we must capitalize on it. So we want to design tasks that enable students to just get on with it without removing the ability for them to make choices or uh, have challenge, but those need to be appropriate. So the second strand of this presentation is about what teachers provide that students rely on in the classroom, whether those things are desirable, and if they are, how do we provide them online? The first one is security. Teachers provide the nudges, the reassurance, the safety net that keeps students confident and gives them security they're doing the right thing. Therefore, if you ask them to do large chunks of un supervised work they start to feel like maybe they've done an hour of work and it's all wrong so what we're saying is that we shouldn't ask students to do too much without some kind of feedback now in frog you can provide self-marking quizzes that will give them instant feedback you can give them the answers to the questions you're asking or you can give them a short task which you provide assessment for at the end the second thing that we think teachers provide is purpose they provide praise they provide rewards and they provide somebody to work for, somebody to impress. So we think that written or verbal feedback is the solution to that. It's essential that when a student does a piece of work, they feel that somebody has cared about it. This is also something that parents can be involved in. Uh, Frog enables parents to see all the written and verbal feedback that we provide students with, and they can show that they're impressed with their child's performance. We're also considering getting rid of formal grading on assignments that are done online and just kind of recording whether they fully, partially or didn't uh, address the success criteria. Because ultimately, home learning is about engaging and doing your best. The third thing that teachers provide is direction. They provide structure, order, progression. They remove students' ability to make choices because they don't have to make choices in the lesson often. Now, we would say at our school that we do give students a choice in the classroom. But let's be honest, when they went home and we weren't there, they found it very difficult to make the choices we were asking them to make because too many of them came straight back to the teachers and went, I don't know what to do. So whilst we have to address that, in the meantime, we need to make sure that we don't give them choices that they can't choose because it exacerbates point one, which was that they need security. So... They want to know they're doing the right thing. If we give them a choice that means that they're not sure they're doing the right thing, immediately they'll feel insecure in the work that they are doing. So here's a summary of where we are after lockdown, which will be followed by an example of the resources that we now use. I use the phrase curated autonomy, partly because I find it amusing to make up a phrase that sounds really complicated, and also because I think it does describe, uh, despite being an oxymoron, what we're actually doing, which is we're saying, well, you've chosen to engage in the work, so now we need to provide something that you can do in the state of mind that you are in when you approach it. So firstly, we don't want to overwhelm them. We want to keep tasks short and we want to give some kind of sequence in what we ask them to do so that they don't feel they have to make too many choices just to get started. And we want to make the choices that we give them choosable. We don't want to take away choice, but we want to make it so that they don't feel insecure if they make a choice and go, well, should I have done the other thing? Would that have been better? And also to provide feedback, either through quizzes or through giving them the answers or through regularly marking short pieces of work they do using verbal feedback. And I can't really emphasise enough how important verbal feedback has been. Students really enjoy hearing our voice when we're not there. And I think although in lockdown that might be especially true, in general, I think that will also be something that they benefit from over time. So I'm now going to give you a very simple example of where we are with the development of our online resources. This is a science website. Now, this is available to all students and parents at all time. They can find it using our science portal. 
We can also point them to it using progression charts within Frog. It says this would be a good idea if you worked on this, but it's also assignable. So everything within the site here can be assigned to students. Um, let me give you an example. So in charges and fields, if I go to grades one to five, what I've got in here is a mini site that reflects what I've been talking about. So it's a manageable sort of chunked into little pieces exercise that starts off with a bit of reading and they can either click watch me or click here down the bottom that takes them to a video which they watch. This is the order that we want them to do it in. It gives them an activity which um, they can use to uh, find out more information. Then they've got a self-assessment where the questions and the answers are available. And finally, there's a frog quiz which they can do. Now they can do that anyway, whenever they want to. But if we assign this piece of work, then the frog quiz will be marked by the computer and the outcome will be sent to the mark book, which means that as a teacher, I would be able to see how they're done and make comments on the individual questions they've done and help them out. To summarize this whole presentation, I would say that although it might sound very obvious, learning without a teacher is a completely different skill. And therefore, when we provide resources for that environment, we have to be very careful. We have to think what it's like to be the student and plan accordingly. We wouldn't expect students to develop the skills of our subjects without practice. Therefore, the skill of learning without a teacher also requires practice. And we have to evaluate how best to give them the support they need to get better at it. And I hope what you've seen in this brief presentation is our attempts to get closer to being able to provide something that suits what students need in that moment where they decide to engage with something that we've asked them to do. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. So thank you again very much, John. And I know Anne also at the school has been very um, instrumental in, in, in making this happen. And obviously his heads of department. Um, the security that John was talking about there, making the students feel secure, making them feel secure about their choices, um, and that there are no wrong choices. But I also liked what uh, John said about um, the children like hearing our voices when we're not there. Brilliant. Right. So next up, uh, I am so excited to meet one of the most motivational people that I've ever come across and had the pleasure of being introduced to a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Nina Ninja Jackson, I think you, you called yourself Nina Fizzy Frog this morning on Twitter. How are you? Absolutely. Good morning, Lucy. Good morning, everybody. I cannot tell you I've been jiggling and dancing in my seat all morning because I am full of fizz because of the amazing, amazing things, the journeys that people have shared so far and that will for the rest of the conference. It is mind blowing. So I am so thrilled and humbled to be with you today. And I am going to rename myself into being a fizzy frog because that's what we do. We jump and giggle around when we're really excited about something. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy, Mark and the team and Gareth. And um, welcome to everybody globally, wherever you are in the world. I'm absolutely thrilled to be with you. And what we're going to do is I'm going to just uh, share my screen with you um, so that we can bring up a little bit of a presentation. Here we go. And we should now have this um, presentation where you can see that what we're going to do today is that we're going to find and share our fizz. And the really, really important thing here is that now that I've lost my screen again, here we go. The really, really important thing here is, is that I've seen fizz so far this morning globally not just in the chat and the presentations and everything but why am i talking about finding and sharing fizz so i'm nina jackson i'm a mental health and well-being global advisor um, a teacher and pedagogical champion and more than anything i like to discover the fizz that's inside lessons, inside individuals, from teachers to children to parents, and to capture that and find out what really makes learning 
explosive amazing absolutely fantastic and some of you may not fully know what a sherbet lemon actually is but it's a sweet that we have in the uk which has a really really hard structure but inside it has this sherbet fizz and whether you're a cruncher or a sucker um by the time you get to that sherbet it's like oh and it's absolutely fantastic and it'll either make you go a little bit like that or, or make your eyes really really wide and that's what i want to do when we look at teaching learning and sherbet lemons and i want to celebrate everybody who has grasped the unprecedented issues that we've had with covid19 and how you've been able to manage and find the fizz to celebrate it and to put it on a global platform whether you use frog or not the most crucial thing is is that we find out how we can engage our students develop our teachers to be even better than what they already are and to be okay sometimes when things don't go quite right so i am the author of our teaching learning and sherbet lemons which is a compendium of really careful advice about a number of things and there's some ed tech tools in there as well um which why we supported with, with a lovely mark anderson ict evangelist so let's have a think about it now, as you can tell, I'm a woman who's worked at this beautiful figurine for years, and I love chocolate. So if life is like a box of chocolates, and work out which film that actually came from, then teaching and learning is like a sherbet lemon. Why is that? We need to have the structures. So even during lockdown, so many of you have still had these school type structures through home learning, online learning, e-learning. And those structures have allowed you to find out actually how different students will engage and share their new fizz way of learning so we've always got to keep those structures and systems but now we're looking at new structures and systems and that's absolutely crucial as we move forward into the future we are crafting right now great humans for the future that can be adaptable and flexible but the problem being sometimes is that they are going to lose their fizz so if I ask you this question, why isn't there fizz sometimes? You know, what are the major challenges for you? So many of you will have embraced these challenges and actually gone head in and been really brave in thinking, OK, if we do this system and we use Google Classroom or we use uh, Frog or we use applications or emails or connecting with students in a really innovative way to check in to see if they're OK, then you are embracing that new challenge, but you're also trying to find the new fizz. So whatever it is that you're working in globally with regards to teaching, learning, pedagogy and practice, just make sure you will always have challenges, but sometimes be OK that there isn't full fizz there. I think we'll all agree right now that what we're trying to do is to create happy, healthy children and young people. That's what we do as, as educators. But I want to come back and really celebrate, and particularly from some of the other uh, people who have presented this morning, what you've done, and thank you for this, is that you've made your staff and your teachers a priority as well. You've thanked them, you've embraced them, but what we need to do as well is that we need to find out what makes us happy and healthy by us fitting our own mask first. And I'm not going to actually do the airline thing, but you get what I mean. Sometimes when there are difficulties and we've lost that fizz, particularly with mental health and well-being, what we need to do is to just reach out and we need to do what I call the check-in, check-out system. Now, what do we actually mean by that? Earlier on, you know, Nick was talking about celebrating birthdays. Bookie was talking about checking in with, with young people, you know, either via WhatsApp or online systems. And many of you will have your own methodologies. When you check in with somebody and you say, you okay? How are things going? 
then what you do is that if there's a response where thing is absolutely fine, you just say, okay, well, I'll check up with you later. And this is not just from an emotional point of view, but this is from an academic learning point of view as well. When things seem to be settled and that you're happy, what you can do is actually you can check out. So think about when you're looking at finding emotional fizz for somebody that you do the check in, check up, and then check out system. And that's about that showing that extra little bit of well-being care. Because if we don't feed the heart to feed the brain so that we can create happy, healthy, really safe environments, really secure learning environments, but to value everybody in that community of learning, then it's not going to work. So I'm going to share with you something called well-being is a work of heart. Now, why am I sharing this with you? Well, well-being is a work of heart is my idea to share your A to Z things of what make you fizzy. And I'll just move that slightly on the screen. But well-being is a work of heart is definitely something that we have to embed in teaching and learning and interweave it into academic progress. The reason I'm saying well-being is a work of heart, during this session this morning, Mark Anderson wants you to tweet from your seat. And if you're going to share a fizzy moment or a, a frog fizzy experience, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer you the opportunity to win this Teach and Learning Sherbet Lemon book and also as well some little extra little things that I can send to you, even if you're in Malaysia. So when we're creating these happy, healthy environments, not only looking at e-safety, but also looking at the emotional well-being, are you checking a that the learning environment that that child student is in is safe for them and whether or not they actually feel secure in accessing that learning. Accessibility is key. And because obviously special education needs and disabilities is one of my areas that I'm very passionate about and I work in as well, the accessible tools are crucial, whether it is from speech to text, there are applications, there are online tools. Oh, well, I do love a little bit of double FN on Word on my Mac, especially when I'm writing, so I don't end up having really, really cramped shoulders and I can speak and write and just be myself. So think about that, feeding the heart to feed the brain. Okay, we know that, you know, in neuroscience, in cognitive development and cognitive overload, there are a variety of different, different chemicals that get released and get dampened, etc., etc. So make that a real priority. So if you're thinking about your inner magic and what your fizz is as a practitioner or as a teacher, isn't it sometimes a little bit hard to find it? Okay, it's really, really difficult, isn't it? And I would like to advocate a global platform for children and young people, similar to some of the social media sites or whatever the case may be, as long as it's safe and secure, to be able to share their learning globally so that everybody can tap into that. It doesn't necessarily have to be about what's happening in school. Many of our children and young people will find their fears by doing own work rather than home or school work so that you actually allow them to expand and find these engaging tools that really want to get them questioning about you know why is this how do i do this oh is that a problem all these different things so that young people can actually have that global platform but occasionally what happens is that we know that some of our students will lose that loving feeling for learning. Many of you, I'm sure, will have had students who have experienced anxiety, maybe even you as a practitioner too. And just be known that, you know, anxiety is actually good for us, but the bad anxiety that builds up over layers like the meal for your pastry can be really, really challenging. So here are some really simple self-care strategies for your students and for your staff. For me, 
every morning after I've read a, a brilliant, brilliant book called The Miracle Morning, I wake up and I ask myself, Nina, what's your purpose today? Because if I don't have a purpose, then I'm not really sure what I'm doing. I'm not really sure how I'm going to impact on others, on the world, or even on myself. So starting each day with what's my purpose, reminding ourselves that there'll be real, real highs and there'll be terrible, sad lows as well. But riding those waves is actually what brings brilliant, brilliant well-being to a balanced place. And at the end of every learning experience, end of every lesson, end of every experience where you're networking or collaborating with parents, staff and students, the gratitude, the three things, okay, that you recognise about yourself that can celebrate you. I mean, three really, really simple things. Celebrate your talents. You as practitioners, as teachers too. But more than anything, enjoy the time right now celebrate them, find what your fizzy moments are and interject that with some really, really good sleep patterns. What I saw this morning is that routines, routines and systems are crucial when we are in uncertain times and we don't know how the world is going to develop. Be okay with sharing worries. Be okay with the fact that you want to celebrate you. But more than anything, I want to ask you today, what's your fizz? What makes learning effervescent in your school? What makes learning effervescent for you as a practitioner? And how do you know that your children are just not feeling the fizz, but are absolutely finding it too? I wanted you to think about you being kind to yourself. Teachers, practitioners, educators, you have globally committed yourself in developing an amazing future which is flexible, adaptable and embracing change. You've been brave and you will continue to be brave. Sometimes, maybe somebody will forget to just check up on you. So please, please, Will you just be kind to yourself too? And when you're kind to yourself, whether it's all devices off or whether it's actually celebrating your face and being really brilliant, then that's okay. I'm Nina Jackson and I'm at Music Mind on Twitter. And I'd like to say to you, global teachers and educators and all fizzy froggies, wherever you are, thank you for all that you are and for all that you do. I hope you have an amazing day and I would love, love to connect with you in the future. Thank you very much. Wow, Nina, thank you. That was absolutely fantastic. And I think at some point we have all experienced that loss of certainty. Oh. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, feed the heart to feed the mind, be kind. Um, finding your fears is something that I will certainly be taking away from today. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. See you Thank later. You. Bye. Bye. So um, the the last uh, the last section this morning before we take a, another very quick break um, is a, a lady called Andrea Lazelle. Now, um, fifty things is something that has been very close to our hearts here in Yorkshire and we've worked very closely with Andrea and her team and I would like to bring Andrea on to talk a little bit about what 50 things to do really is. So hi Andrea, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm, I'm really impressed to be here but I'm also a little bit daunted with all the wonderful presentations that I've been following. Um, 50 Things is um, a bucket list of experiences presented in a smartphone app um, and localised in local authority areas. It's been developed by Frog and we're continuing to develop all the time. We're currently launched in seven areas and we're delighted that a growing number of children and families um, are benefiting from this at your fingertips resource. Um, 
I'm sharing a screen, I think. Can you confirm that, Lucy? Yeah. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, not at the moment, Andrew. I think I might be any minute. Oh, far too many. Let's oh, try it's, it's, that one. How's that? Am I sharing that? Yeah, perfect. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I love the technology of all of this. Okay, so 50 Things was developed by St Edmunds Nursery School and Children's Centre, which is in Girlington in Bradford. Uh, we're a four times outstanding maintained nursery school. And it was developed in response to primary heads, talking about children entering reception with limited experiences that they'd gained. Now, at St Edmunds, we've got a long history of working in collaboration with children and families. Um, and we believe that all parents want better for their child. But we also recognise that many parents are uncertain about what experiential learning is needed, if children are to be ready for the learning that's available to them in their journey through primary education. So um, we wanted to, to provide fingertip information, um, recognising that parents are very often um, using their mobile phone a great deal. But I'm not able to share the smartphone app with you. We have websites as well. Um, and you can see screenshots of the website of the smartphone app here. Um, you can download the 50 Things Bradford app via this QR code. Um, we've been very lucky in terms of being featured by Look North. Um, and had a great deal of support from local authorities, from different agencies. And we genuinely feel that we've more chance of reaching um, more families when it's a universal offer, which was part of the criteria for, for what we included within the app. It had to be things that were universally accessible to every child in our district and the districts in which we work. Part of that universality was about the activities being low cost or no cost but most of all they had to be fun and one of the the resources that's available in the app is about creating memories so recalling recapping those experiences uploading photos that are only available to to the app user um, we've had support from uh, the time said supplement in terms of a very positive report from them um, there's an opportunity within the app to also share memories, inspire others. And whilst people can post on social media, they can also share those photographs with extended family um, and people that, that they want to um, share with. Now, this tab on the website gives us an idea of the 50 things to do before you five. Um, the activities were developed um, in collaboration, consultation with community members, professionals, parents, families. Um, and I'd just like to show you one of them um, in this short time that I've got to talk to you. Um, sharing books, which is a fairly fundamental principle, I think, of, of the sort of activities that we would like all children to be able to access before they're five. Um, there's a, a, a bit of an introduction about what the activity is going to be, and then a series of tabs, drop down tabs, that families can use and interact with. So we go from how to do it to what you'll need, where would you do it, when would you do it, why would you do it? Because our initial funding um, was around oracy and language development, we've introduced up to half a dozen key words in each of the activities to try and inspire parents with the idea that they should be introducing language and this is how their babies and toddlers will learn. We have a top tips section. In good early years um, principle, we have books and stories linked to each of the activities. We've got links to resources, which is very often YouTube videos or other websites that give um, really accessible information to parents and families. We have local links. So you can see here um, on the Bradford app and website, there are times for story and rhyme times at Bradford Libraries and how to join the library um, and a Google map of how to find. We're very fortunate in that we've got a um, couple of imagination libraries in Bradford. Another activity to try where we lead people around the app 
There's um, a tab on research and articles so that people who want a bit more depth can get that. But we've also got uh, research and articles and special educational needs. Um, as I said earlier, it's a wholly inclusive um, app that is available for all children. And one of our colleagues, um, uh, deputy head of a special school, has looked through each of the activities and looked at um, how many children might respond to that. Um, I just want to stop sharing that screen now, if I may. So um, we're really grateful to be here today. We'd like you to, to remember really the well-being of parents and families and all the children coming into your schools, into uh, nursery reception, um, and recognise that for many families, this has been a really challenging time. Um, we've got a quote from um, a parent, Fran, who was a parent of a three-year-old, who talked about lockdown being really difficult. She's a single parent family who was her three-year-old sole companion for a long time. And she talked about, with the best will in the world, she's not as much fun as her three-year-old's friends. Um, and she said, I can look at the grid and get um, a part of an idea, or I can just think about the next 30 minutes, read through and follow it. And then I know she's had a really good experience and interaction. It helps me feel like I'm doing all the things I can do to make Mari and me feel better. So I think um, I would just commend you to have a look at the website, contact us if you're interested in rolling this out um, with your multi-academies trust or local authority and look forward perhaps to talking to some of you again. Thanks very much. So Andrea, thank you so much. We'll make sure that all of those details are available to you post-conference. There will be a survey going out and um, obviously a lot of you will want to connect with some of our speakers here today. So mm -hmm. that brings us to, thank you again. Um, that brings us to the end of this, this second section. Gosh, can you believe we started which seems like a quite a while ago with Bookie and then we've had all of these fantastic speakers and now we're at a break and then we'll so we will be back it is now 11 38 and we will be back at 11 50 so a very short 10 12 minute break um straight after that we will be introducing simon o'grady um to the stage to talk a little bit about what he's been doing both in mexico and now back into the uk so thank you very much and we'll see you very soon so hello and welcome back to everyone. This is our last section of the day. So we will be talking to Simon O'Grady, we'll be talking to Adrian Tate, we'll be talking to Matt Holly, and then uh, Mark Anderson will also be joining us to talk about uh, a hybrid learning approach. So first up, we have the absolute pleasure of bringing on stage uh, this morning is Simon O'Grady. So the last time I met with Simon was in his school in Mexico, but now Simon's back in the UK and taken on a slightly different role with High Performance Learning, uh, an organisation that we are very much uh, aligned in our values with. So Simon, um, apart from your three degrees, your multiple head teacherships uh, in all sorts of different countries, you're now back here. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. And I will hand straight over to you. Well, Lucy, I'm delighted to be virtually here and uh, to address our conference. Uh, and uh, I've really enjoyed the sessions this morning and uh, clear that from some common challenges, significant creative solutions have been born um, but of course we're meeting at significant moments and as education responds to the straitjacket of lockdown and it's been a difficult experience for children confinement has constrained their well-being uh, with big issues of access and equity across the globe access to decent learning spaces and good technology of exaggerated existing inequities, uh, as assessed by UNESCO's framework for reopening schools. Equity has worsened as millions more children are schoolless. Pre-COVID, the UIS reported that uh, 260 million children do not attend school. Countrywide lockdown 
across the world has made this worse. In stark contrast, however, schools have responded creatively, caringly, and a new world of blended learning has been born. According to the World Economic Forum, COVID action platform, three things have changed for good. First, we now educate in an interconnected world. Second, the role of the educator has been redefined and our focus has shifted to lifelong learning and skills such as resilience and adaptability. And third, technology has changed the means of educational delivery forever. There is no going back. In this short address, I wish to promote progressive ideas rooted in research, and projecting a future which focuses on how children learn, how great schools support, and indeed how frog education is shaping this journey. Primers and others have drawn together the threads of effective educational responses. This OECD framework both guides and affirms our approaches, represented in our schools across the world, with of course amazing examples from earlier speakers today. Task force style management based on a rebuilt curriculum and blended learning with a big emphasis on student well-being, supporting and leveraging our parents and using new opportunities to build professional learning communities to support and develop our staff. These have been the key features of our framing responses. In assessing our impact in a period of suddenly enforced closure, the Education Endowment Foundation highlights successful strategies in the meta-analysis of remote learning. Access to technology and peer-to-peer -peer support the dominant features. Before, however, is great teaching and an understanding of learning. Structured teaching, clarity of explanation and scaffolding and personalized feedback. Center staging all of this is the importance of independent learning skills and support for metacognition and the need for self-reflection by students and indeed by teachers. Most children, we can expect high performance. Based on 40 years of proven research by Air, Dweck, and others. We see that high performance is rooted in teaching children cognition, in unwrapping the complexities of learning, and in teaching children how to think and how to behave. Achieved through a pedagogy-led framework that expects high impact on attainment, attitudes and values, and well-being. The World Economic Forum, COVID has changed our educational mission, moving us towards developing skills of creativity, critical thinking, and entrepreneurship, but balanced by a need for empathy and emotional intelligence. As we succeed here, we expect to see improved attainment greater well-being as children develop two kinds of cognitive understanding, knowledge of cognition and the regulation of cognition. Metacognitive knowledge splits into knowledge, self, task and strategies, whilst regulation of cognition involves planning, monitoring, and evaluating cognition. Teachers 
focus on improved practice gets and keeps great people. And it creates a team of outstanding professionals. Leaders, cutting edge professional practice gives advantages at the point of admission and connects to other outstanding schools. In piecing this all together, we are seeing beyond our current crisis. We offer our schools a journey to world class, which means an expectation of high performance from all students. We challenge together the old thinking that straitjackets children and limits performance, and offer instead a proven research based pathway with a trajectory for student success. Our education supports this journey with radically innovative solutions. Framing the characteristics of academic performance, the values, attributes, and attitudes that support them has been our first engagement with FROG as we make the future happen now. The rich well that we have drawn from today shows how an outstanding schools operate in crisis situations. Outstanding schools focus on students and define those attributes they wish to see in children and young people. Structure, systems, and measures of accountability are all built around this. Core curriculum is vision linked within and beyond the classroom. Confident by nature, outstanding schools involve students and parents at the heart of learning. In outstanding schools, students enjoy, they enjoy and they trust their teachers. Internal accountabilities account for more than external regulation. Where a culture of ongoing improvement prevails. Purposeful yet relaxed, outstanding schools never stand still. Piecing it all together, necessity has framed creative responses and kept children learning. Piecing it all together, uncertainty casts its shadow on reopening and the logistics around it. Piecing it all together, schools are given their children structure and support in the face of confinement and isolation. Our conference celebrates so much of the good practice as it's been fashioned and shared. And as we look ahead, we do so in the knowledge that we will piece it all together. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you so much for for sharing that insight and certainly around um, how how the outstanding schools are focusing on students. And I think everybody here today has been focusing very much their attention on students and making them feel safe and secure. So thank you very much for, for joining us and I'm hoping you'll stay around till the end of today. Certainly well. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So um, next we have um, Adrian Tate joining us. So Adrian is from the North East. Adrian has been part of the Frog family for oh, a very long time. I think we've known each other probably getting on for around 10 years. Hi, Adrian. How are you? Hi, how are you doing? Yes, it's been a long time we've known each other. Um, I was just thinking, this is a bit like Eurovision Song Contest. I've got to say how well, wonderful it's been going so far. It's been a fantastic performance. Everyone's been amazing. Uh, the results for the North East are going to be. Um, no, no, uh, we've known each other for quite a, we've known each other quite a long time. Uh, and yeah, it's been a fantastic to get involved. This is the first time I've been involved with a conference. Uh, I was involved a while ago. Um, but it is the first time that I suppose, um, yeah, I've been, I've been kind of, like this, this is all kind of new and, and different and kind of a bit unique. 
it is it's uh, it's the first time you've been involved but you can see how long you've been with frog and it's almost like you've raided our merchandise cabinet from behind you i think i've got more merchandise than you guys have to be honest uh, I think you have. Adrian, I'm going to pass over to you now. I'm going to come off the screen. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, so, like Lucy said, uh, my name is uh, Adrian Tate. Uh, I'm from a school in, uh, in, in Newcastle. Uh, it's a large, comprehensive school. Um, it's a high school, so uh, we teach uh, students from uh, the year nine up to sixth form. Uh, so, yeah, quite a large school, and uh, I have to admit, uh, Lockdown sounds crazy has been amazing for me. Uh, so what I mean by that is, is that when lockdown was on the kind of horizon, uh, I was everyone's best mate. So uh, the idea, the fact that Frog uh, could do so many things uh, that we couldn't currently do uh, was amazing. All right. So basically, uh, I was asked to do loads of things. And one of the things we kind of hooked up upon quite early was this idea of, it's all well and good we can use frog to uh supply students with uh, access to materials uh we can set work for them uh we can get them to hand work in uh one of the things we couldn't do and uh we found quite difficult to do was this idea of um supporting students at home the idea the fact that we couldn't just uh give access to us and that's one of the things that you can't do in the classroom it's dead easy we can obviously uh help and support students uh, whatever their needs are, we can talk to them, we can do what we like, uh, but for some bizarre reason, what we can't do is we can't support them at home. And that's one of the things that we, we kind of looked at quite early on. Uh, terrible as it may seem, I'm seeing to have a bit of a problem with my PowerPoint presentation, but don't worry, uh, I do have a backup, so we're all right. Um, so yeah, so I was asked to kind of to help and support some of the students, so some of the staff, sorry, at school, you know, to creating a well-being website. Uh, so that's what we did. We looked at how we could support our students' well-being from home, uh, and what we this first of all decided upon was what we wanted to put in there. So we wanted to make it easy, accessible. So something that was dead forward, straightforward for students to find uh, from the offset, and that's what we kind of did. We looked at this idea of how we could support and uh, engage students at home. Um, um, so yeah, essentially, I'm going to talk to you very, very quickly about what we made, uh, the most wonderful website we set up um, to help and support students at home. So the first thing we're going to think about is what, what was the problem? What did we have? Now, we had an issue. We could support and help students when it came to learning. What we couldn't do is support and help students with their well-being at home. So we decided to put this wonderful little website together. So we start to think about, well, what's the key things we need to kind of tell students? What's the key things that we need to kind of show students? Um, and the first thing we thought was, not rocket science, we need to show them, explain them about what it's all about. So this is our little website. Um, we had a little kind of little welcome message to make sure the fact that students um, were able to get that little bit of a personal touch. So it says there, uh, hello and my name. Uh, now, obviously, students' names came up there when they did log in. Now, that's, if you don't know, by the way, I, I know this is all done in Frog, but it could be done in any platform or any kind of website builder. Uh, that little personal message is put in there with a little widget called personalized welcome widget. So we then thought, right, we need to give students access to numbers because it's all well and good saying, well, you know, yes, you can contact school. You should have a school number by now. Um, but actually, weirdly enough, what about things like giving them the responsibility to say, well, actually, if you believe you are unsafe, you can call the police. You can talk to people. There's no reason why you can't call the police. You can't call somebody in your local area for social services. It's all well and good, like I say, saying, well, yeah, contact school. But actually, it's not wrong to, to give students access to these numbers. Now, again, using the power of frog, which, you know, is fully is amazing. We've got on here, these are called, it's a little link, uh, link called telephone links. Literally, students could click on those numbers and it actually would ring. So again, the students have to go, got to worry about you know, going out and kind of writing stuff down and then ringing on their phones. Literally, they press those numbers. If they're on a mobile device, it would actually automatically ring. Fantastic little thing. Dead easy, dead straightforward. We then want to think about, right, we all know. We all know that students have access to a million different apps on their phones, all right, so, which is fantastic. However, we thought, well, actually, wouldn't it be good if we came up with a list, a list of key things? Here's some fantastic websites. 
Here's some from fantastic apps where you can actually look at and find information out to help you and support you during the lockdown, which is completely different to anything else that students have kind of you know seen. I mean, the amount of students that said to us, actually, uh, you've seen this before, haven't you? You've been in lockdown before. You know what it's like. We didn't even know what lockdown was like. We didn't know what the situation was like. We needed help and support. And that's obviously great for them. Again, they click on these wonderful little links. They go straight to the apps. They go straight to the websites. And again, there's a little, uh, little tool in there called Link to Website. You've probably all seen it if you have got Frog. But again, a cool little, little app, little widget, sorry. That literally, click and you go. Now, that was great. But actually, we thought about this a bit more and thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if we got some impact, some feedback from the students about what apps, what things that they've done? So again, we create a little sub page on here. This is all in one single site, a little sub page that said, right, if you've got a fantastic website that you think is really important, tell us, you let us know. We'll then look at that wonderful website. We will decide, actually, do you know what it is? That is really useful. Let's add it to our list. And then we were, as we were going along, we were actually picking up the information from the students and then putting it on our wonderful site, giving the students a bit of ownership over it, allowing them to basically say, well, actually, I tried that website, it was pants. I tried that app, it was amazing. Let's add it to the list. The students have a bit of ownership. So that's a form. Again, you could do it on any kind of platform, but in, in Frog, it's called a form widget to do that. Now, we thought, right, we uh, spoke to um, our uh, wonderful, um, counselor in school and she sat and worked out some wonderful stuff that she think was really important to give to kids so we did so we created a little area and this little area is linked from this little section and this is all about tips for coping because it's all well and good at giving access to wonderful websites but actually we wanted to focus some of the students on some of the important things that we think were really helpful and really useful so what we did is we created this little, this little section here and again this is called a, a picture series widget so the idea is when you hover over these wonderful things, uh, the, basically the images kind of pop up. It it's all looks wonderful. Um, but the idea is the fact that it made it easy accessible for students. And again, here's some of the pages. So the idea is we had things like, oops, the idea is we had things that um, allowed students to see some wonderful stuff. So we had support networks. Don't forget the idea, the fact that there are uh, loads of people you can actually speak to and talk to if you need to. Uh, the idea, the fact that we had uh, wonderful pages about um, breathing, which again, you might think straightforward. Everyone knows how to breathe, but actually, you know, st students struggle with these things about how to keep themselves grounded, uh, about sleeping techniques. And again, the idea was the fact this was there and this was available for everybody to look at, uh, not just the students, but yeah, I mean, students mainly was our kind of focus, but we also had uh, parents going on there and staff as well. And um, the last little bit was a little PDF. And again, there's a little PDF widget to make that dead easy for, for to add on. So again, all one and good, we've told them where to go externally, but what about internal? What about the idea of giving them access internally? Now, normally, if you had a student in your classroom who you thought, yeah, they're having a few issues, it looks like they're kind of struggling with what's going off, you know, I'll pick up the phone, I'll, I'll have a chat to one of the guys in school, and then they can go and have a chat to them or so on and so forth. That's fine. But actually, when they're at home, what do they do? So we give them direct access. We said, look, you know, if you're struggling, then yeah, please do contact us. But be aware that it's not 24 seven. We're not, we're not social media uh, lovers, or well, some of us might be, but we're not gonna be sitting 24 seven on our phone just in case a student contacted us. So it's about giving them, yes, a contact, but making sure they're aware of the fact that actually, um, you know, we're not gonna be there 24 uh, seven. No doubt, that was, sorry, by, by the way, that's a text widget that was on that, I think I created kind of made over the top major. Um, no doubt, like all of us in the different areas of the world, uh, we were getting bombarded from left, right, and centre with different kind of PDF files or, or pictures or posters or whatever from the police and from local authorities and, and everybody else. And we was getting that information to students. We found quite difficult, all right, and the idea of getting it across. So we said, right, what we're going to do, we'll create a section on here. We'll say, right, anything that we get in, any kind of files we get in, we're going to put in there. We're going to actually give them access to the students, to the parents, as soon as physically possible. All right. So we literally decided that's what we're going to do. We're going to create a little area. The students can click on a PDF. They can have a read. They can see what it's about. And then obviously they can then move over. That's something called a shared folders widget. Again, obviously, many different ways you can do that on different platforms.
we did have a staff area. Got to admit, it's not as pretty and as exciting as some of the other pages. Uh, so again, in here, we had some information that we thought was key to staff. And again, they can have a look at that. They can see what it's all about. Again, that was a shared folder widget, nothing too exciting and over the top. Now, this last little section, I apologize. So this was my idea, and we started thinking about it, but didn't quite get there. The idea of having a dear Jane or an ask Jane or some kind of section where um, students were able to post a little bit of information uh, that's sent to our, um, our counselor in school. The idea was she was going to have a read of them. And then if she thought that other students might be interested to hear, um, she would then put it on this wonderful page. The reason why it didn't go to plan was because um, time wise, we didn't have a lot of time. We don't um, obviously our counselor is quite busy at the moment of time. So we decided to kind of not do this. But the idea was that students could fill in the form. It gets emailed to the council. The council will then have a look at it and then decide, actually, do you know what it is? That's probably a similar idea or a similar kind of situation or some other students might have the same kind of anxiety or pressures. So let's kind of, you know, open it up and let all students find that. Um, but like I say, we didn't unfortunately get there um, because of time constraints. Now, uh, there's our website. It was amazing, but what was the actual impact? Well, one of the good things we could do on Frog is we can see uh, how many times students or people have accessed the site. And I think, you know, granted we've got a, a large school, so I say about 1,800 students, uh, we didn't do so badly, all right? We had about 836 visitors uh, over lockdown. So during lockdown, uh, we had this. Granted, we didn't do this for the first month or so, I think it was. Um, but we had, you know, a lot of students going on there. But what actual impact of that? What did that make us do? Well, actually, it was really useful to know who. And not only who, how many times they were accessing the site. And again, there's a little widget. It's pretty cool. It's called the visitor log. That told us not only who was accessing the site, but how often. That was a massive thing. Because not only did we know the fact it was being looked at, we could then look and see, oh, wait a minute. Little Johnny's been on this website a number of times over the past few days. I wonder if it would be a good idea to contact that student. Not saying, by the way, uh, you've been looking at this wonderful website, uh, but basically by contacting them saying, hi, how are things? How are you doing? What's going on? And that's kind of what we did. And one of the tools that, again, in Frog is amazing, which, again, you may or may not know, is something called the Messages tool. Messages tool. That allowed us to send a message to the students all right, because we had an issue with some pupils not answering the phones. Then when they logged on, if they've got the app on their phone, it pinged on their phone. And it allowed them to get that little starting point. By the way, I've sent you an email. Or by the way, I'm going to ring you today. Or by the way, um, we want to know how things are going. So I apologize for technical death issues. Um, it's terrible for me to do that. Um, but hopefully, a brief insight into what kind of things that we did. I know Lucy's going to kick me off in a second. So uh, insight into one of the cool things that we've done. We've done a million and ten things. Um, which no doubt most of us are doing. Um, I've got a bit of a croak in my throat, so I'll have a quick drink anyway. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Adrian, thank you so much. Uh, I'm just wondering how much more merch you'll make be able to snaffle away from us. That was really good. And as Simon said before, um, outstanding schools focus on students. And that's students, student well-being, the various forms of communication that you've um, you've engaged with there and interest in the chat has been going quite crazy about people getting uh, uh, emails and texts through the night more than ever so I think you've highlighted something that has resonated with the audience very much so so thank you again and I'll catch up with you soon bye no Adrian. Um, so, so the next uh, next person that I'd like to introduce you to today is is Matt Holly. Matt is from River Tees Multi Academy Trust. Hello. Now, Matt, I know from talking to you that um, nothing stopped with you at all. No, not at all. So you've not had much strength, <clears throat> really. No, we uh, we we continue throughout just because we are um, an alternative provision. So. Um, all of our children were classed as vulnerable, so we we had quite a few of them in throughout the whole of, of the time that it was there uh, going on. Well, thank you again for taking the time out of your holiday today for no, sharing the story. Fine. I'm going to disappear and hand over to you now. Thank you. Okay. All right, hello everyone. So let me just get this PowerPoint going.
So yeah, so as um, Lucy just said, I'm Matt Holly. Um, I'm an e-learning lead at River Tees Academy, Multi Academy Trust. Um, so basically, we are a, an academy of five schools, and we are an alternate provision. Um, we deal with learners that are um, either excluded from school or at risk of permanent exclusion, and we also deal with learners that have got medical needs. Um, what we did with Frog before lockdown is that we, we tried to create quite a lot of different areas within Frog so that our learners could use different aspects of it. So that could uh, go from careers uh, to our Thrive approach that we use, um, our Send, our all of our different subjects. So we used to put, we'd house them all in the in the same area. What we'd also build is a student area for the students, so that would give them the useful links. Um, it would also give them links to, similar to what uh, Adrian was talking about, um, with the COVID-19 and uh, the wellbeing. So we created a wellbeing page where that had the links as well. Um, we did exam revision and the home learning. We also, we developed just before lockdown, the CPD area so that our staff had a lot of the CPD that they needed and different areas. So these are our subject areas. And we also developed a careers area. So this was done about six, about probably about a year ago, actually. I was showing Lucy this last time we met. Um, and it's basically, this has been fundamental for some of the learners that are leaving school and going on to post 16 and haven't had us there, uh, um, giving them the advice that they needed. Um, so they've had all access to the local colleges around the area. They've also had um, what is happening in the local labour market, which is great for them to know what jobs are around um, St Middlesbrough and Newcastle, where my school is. Um, but what we've been focused on a lot of is our positive mental health and emotional wellbeing site. So this was designed by our mental health nurse that we have in site and on, um, in our school. And basically what she wanted to do is create an area for A, to support with the wellbeing of our staff, so within that, there is uh, forums, there's chat areas, different things for staff to, to be encouraged. There's um, inspirational quotes. There's, there's many different areas. There's links to lots and lots of different websites and phone numbers for staff if they ever needed it. Um, we've also created, or trying to create, because it is a, a vast amount of work, an A to Z of all the mental health conditions and learning difficulties with supportive strategies available so that we encourage staff to understand and be aware of what's going on and what the different um, needs are for the learners. We do express that it's definitely not a diagnostic tool. What it is, it's an area for support and an area for awareness. So they would be able to find different areas where they would see overviews of what maybe the condition was, what symptoms they might see, certain positive interventions that could be put in place. Um, but also within them interventions, there would be case studies that people have made within the school of how them interventions have worked, what type, what the learner was like and different aspects of, of how it worked. So then we got to COVID and FROG was fundamental in how we uh, designed our curriculum when it came to COVID. Yes, we didn't close, but we did have quite a few learners that were working from home. Because of that, we needed to really figure out how we could then get them to access Frog completely from home without the support. Yes, we were doing phone calls for wellbeing, but they needed that help within Frog so that they could support their learning. But our rapid support response, first of all, was to make sure that our staff definitely knew what was going on. There was so much uncertainty and every day things changed within the, the news. Um, policies were changed constantly. So what we did is we created, instead of having a handbook, we created a COVID-19 site where staff would be able to see rotors, they would be able to see what they need to know, um, school procedures, GDPR, um, what we were offering to the learners, <clears throat> and then just useful links so that they could keep up to date as well as we were, because we didn't know anything more than they were hearing on the news. We also created a little bit like what Adrian said, not as complex, but we created a, a COVID-19 and wellbeing site for the learners, which give them uh, interactive links so that they could um, visit sites that would help them with the wellbeing. Um, they would have just little different tools on there. Uh, there'd be a letter for the parents and lots of different things that we would update regularly so that the, 
the students and the parents understood what was going on the same as what we did. What we then had to do is really think about, because we were working on a rotor system, what type of CPD could we take advantage of during this time? And not just use it as a time of fear, but use it as a time for advantage. And so what we did is we really enhanced and developed our CPD development, looking at what different aspects that we could actually look at for, for staff to, um, to really engage with. We did have quite a few reluctant or technophobes, as you would say, in, in work. So we needed to, to give them a safe place and a place that they could do online CPD uh, to help develop in their career. We used the presentation tool to create our own in-house training as well for staff so that we could then um, look at what they were doing. They could answer questions so that we had actually some feedback of what they'd learned. Um, we went through quite a huge curriculum change just before COVID and it was about to be launched as we were going into lockdown. So that was kind of off put. So what we had to do is kind of think cleverly about how we can just drip feed some of that new information into there and using the presentation tool on Frog was absolutely fantastic for that. We then developed something called a tech lab. So within the tech lab, what we did is we looked at what different um, systems would staff either need to use at work or systems that would be enjoyable to work with. So Photoshop or iMovie might be something that someone might take, take up and enhance uh, their skills. Or it might have been the fact that we're using Teams at work because a lot of our meetings then became Teams. So what we did is we created video tutorials that were created by the staff for the staff. These were also used with some students. So for instance, when they were doing iMovie in class, they were using the same as what the teachers would use. We also linked quite a lot of things to podcasts and just giving them as much information as they could. Podcasts, reading materials, everything like that was kind of at their disposal. In terms of the learning, so what we did is we created staff videos. And again, it's been said uh, one or two times today, it's so good for the learners to see the face of the teacher, to hear the teacher's voice. It makes all of the difference. You Sometimes using the, the YouTube videos, you can kind of lose them, but when they see their teacher there, see their teacher doing the work, it really encouraged them. And the feedback we got from the students, some funny, but it was, it was really, really, um, really good. We then also created using the hotspot tool, which um, was fantastic. We created interactive knowledge organizers. So this was for the year 11s at the time that were going to be doing their exams. And this is before we knew anything happening about the exams. We created interactive um, knowledge organizers. So that say for instance, with the poppies, they would be able to click any single line and that would tell them what that line was about. So they could take notes and they could get feedback and they would be able to move on with the questions that we'd give them. We've done exam revision, which you can see on there for the students. And that's just inside. So this would be the maths where they would get the past papers, the useful links, the resources, and then it would link to the actual math site, which had all of the resources that we would use anyway. Over lockdown, what we've struggled with is um, modern foreign language within our setting. Um, we come, our learners are from a very disadvantaged background and it was sometimes quite difficult to introduce that into the curriculum. What we'd found over COVID is using Duolingo as an app was um, really, really successful. We also used Frog to bring that in as a helpful tool. We also then encouraged them to cook at home using some Spanish recipes um, and we changed them every week. So for the staff, because we were working in bubbles and because the staff were working on rotors, sometimes we didn't have the specialists that we needed in school at the time. We are a very small school due to the, uh, the cohort that we've got. So sometimes we had teachers that were teaching lessons that weren't their subject. So what we did is we had each subject create a special COVID curriculum for their subject that was easily accessible. And with the use of the videos from the teachers, they were able to then teach in the classroom in their bubble. So looking forward to the future. So what can we take from this and the new way of working? So I've just got a video of my CEO just talking quickly about how she's felt 
around the, um, the, the pandemic and frog. I'm Christina Jones, I'm Chief Executive of River Tees Multi Academy Trust. We work with um, learners who are highly disadvantaged, who've been excluded from school or who can't attend their mainstream school due to health issues. So having an online learning platform has been fundamental to the work we do um, over the last few years. During the last few weeks, um, during the unprecedented times of the COVID pandemic, we've really been able to develop our expertise using the platform. We've had really good feedback from learners, parents, and our staff about how easy it's been to use. And moving forward, we're going to make it a key element of our blended learning offer. We recognise some learners might have emotionally based school avoidance or might have anxieties that mean they're less likely to be able to cope with a full in-school day. Um, having a learning platform like Frog means that we can really offer them a high quality learning experience that we're still assessing and in line with other learners who may be on different blended offers. Some of our learners that we've got at the moment, we found that the ones that weren't engaging before lockdown actually started to engage during lockdown. So from that, we're going to be introducing some of our learners on part-time timetables, so introducing the technology for when they're at home as well as at school, so they are actually getting their full education rather than the part-time that was available due to different circumstances and different needs. Um, we'll be providing more homework with it and with the specialists in every room, so the videos and everything like that. Overall, Frog's been absolutely fantastic during this process and generally it's it's the... It's been amazing in terms of how we've worked. So, um, it, yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Oh, that that's really that's so kind. Thank you. Thank you so much for for coming on today. No and I think it's a real accolade that the the kids that were on a part time time timetable are now getting that full time education. So, thank you for sharing your story. Thanks. So um, the, the last person to join us this morning before we bring Gareth back on stage, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome and that's Mark Anderson. Now Mark has worked with, um, well has been involved with the Froggies here for a, a, couple, a good couple of years now and uh, we bounce a lot of ideas off each other. So. Mark, thank you so much, and um, hopefully we're going to hear about the tweet from your seat as well. So I'm going to hand straight over to you, Mark. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Thank you so much, Lucy, and just thank you so much, everybody. I've had such a fantastic day today, and it's been lovely hearing people say thank you to me. But it's been the hard work of Lucy and the team and Chris behind the scenes and, and Graham sort of running all the, the, the stuff behind it. Uh, Tony Parkin tweeted a moment ago about how great the handover stuff you've been doing, Lucy, has been. And, and it's always a real great privilege to work with Frog because as an organization you, you know your, your, the, the vision and values of the organization really really shine through uh, I'm going to do that thing um, where I'm going to try and share my screen and um, if you could help me please uh, Lucy perhaps uh, just by giving me a, a little nod when you can see uh, my presentation which should be coming up about now um, I can see it Happy days. Uh, so the session's called Hybrid Learning, Reasons to be Cheerful, one, two, three. But how do I actually follow all these amazing presentations from uh, from, from Nikki Taylor to Bookie Youssef to the panel discussion with Sophie and uh, Nick's opening session? I really can't follow it, but what I can do is say that so many of the messages really give me so much hope for the future uh, when it comes to the learning uh, um, and, uh, that happens in our schools uh, across the world. And one of the things that was central to our conversations when we were shaping the event today um, was about bringing stories together. And hopefully we've, we've been able to do that uh, and brought together loads and loads of stories from schools and teachers uh, from around the world to help you think about how you're going to be uh, sort of moving things forward with teaching uh, for learning uh, come September. And it was great to hear uh, Kate's uh, um uh, sort of uh, discussions around the plans for the future um, uh, up in Manchester as well. So what is hybrid learning? Well, actually, 
there is no one size fits all thing. We know this. Some people have been talking today about there being no silver bullets in education. And clearly, that's absolutely the case. It's all about your context. You can't take what works in one school and apply it directly to what works in your school. But we can see there's some consistency or tenets uh, of, of what does actually work. But um, going back to the Bananarama principle that I mentioned in the chat earlier, it's not so much what you do uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to your technology and your teaching for learning. It's the way that you do it and the choices you make are, again relate back to uh, directly to your context in your school lots of us have heard these terms asynchronous and synchronous but hybrid learning is actually that thing where we blend those things together and hybrid learning is often sort of, uh, has that uh, term blended learning uh, in there as well and they're very much of a similar sort of a nature when you bring these two things together and a polar approach we found during lockdown um, where you have either one approach or the other approach has tended to not be very successful and so thinking carefully about how you blend these things together is much more likely to bring wins and, and things for you um, and something that's really central to that uh, and that's been again resonated and really echoed through in, in nearly all of the presentations presentations today it goes to that really important triangulation between parents the school and the child and that wrapper we can put around there um, it was really great to hear um, you know so I mentioned in the chat earlier about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and we, we saw that uh, in loads of the presentations from Nick's presentation uh, uh, right at the start of the day where he was talking about providing structure with structure comes confidence we know what we're supposed to be doing when we're supposed to be doing it all those sorts of things and providing those base level needs uh, to provide security uh, and structure and clarity for our children and our families enables them to actually plan what they need to do in order to best support their children and that's been really really great to hear uh, echoed again and resonating through in lots of the conversations and we've heard over the course of the day and obviously with that uh, students are much more likely to flourish and succeed than they otherwise would without that structure so Hybrid learning involves lots of things. I've mentioned um, some of the things that have been discussed elsewhere, but we've seen key themes across the whole day of things such as community, uh, well-being, uh, safeguarding. It was great hearing the conversation from Kate in the panel discussion with uh, with Sophie and Nick uh, about how they were going about safeguarding, and, and, and it's so important to make sure we look after our young people in that regard. Also thinking about that rounded education uh, with extracurricular and uh, leadership being so central to all all of that uh, and learning being at the heart of absolutely everything. If you've seen me present before, you often uh, will have seen me having these sorts of uh, recipes for success. And so I've brought these different categories across. And if we can have these sorts of things in place, and we're really looking to hopefully have this rounded education, which is so important in, in all of our schools uh, to provide a, a, a really great learning opportunity and experience for our learners and supporting our families and parents uh, and guardians at home. And if we miss some of these things out, if we, if we forget learning, then obviously we failed. If there's no leadership, there's anxiety, and you know, clarity around what we're trying to actually achieve. If you don't bring in things around extracurricular and supporting things, I saw in the chat a few moments ago, someone commented uh, about uh, how most of their uh, their work, I think it was Kate actually, a lot of their emails came in outside of normal teaching hours. Um, and and without the, the extracurricular things and the support around all that, we miss opportunities. And without safeguarding, there's danger. How do we know that our young people are safe online? And without thinking about well-being, then there's that, uh, that real issue around stress and mental health not just for our, our students but for our teachers as well we need them to be at our very very best and that quote from bookie earlier uh, was absolutely key to that from her head teacher uh, which i tweeted earlier as well and if we don't involve the whole community then then how can we actually expect engagement from all of our, our key stakeholders it's so important to consider these things and look at what we can miss out if we miss one of these things uh, then we're not going to be doing very well if we miss a few of these things then it's really not going to work very well for us and there's been so many amazing takeaways uh, from the day today what a difference a day makes hopefully you're going to walk away from the session today at uh, the conference today uh, with oodles of ideas and things that you can try and implement into your school day come september 
Keeping Parents in the Loop, how that took place at Finton House. We heard from Katie Cousins, uh, Adrian Tate at Gosforth Academy uh, with his well-being approaches there. And as we heard from uh, Matt Holly at River Tees Matt as well. And um, I, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed actually, Adrian, because things seem to be going quite well with my presentation. As I said in the chat, I quite like it when things don't go quite right. Uh, just so we can model, uh, model, 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 as Kate said, uh, what we can do when things don't go quite right. But you modeled it so well, Adrian. Adrian, because you just persevered and a solution was found with support from the team from Gar uh, from Graham sorry and, and it really really worked well so thank you so much for your presentation Adrian uh, taking every lesson online from Keith Peary, seeing what was going on at the British School of Paris as well, and what we heard from Kate around safeguarding, keeping all those things in place, absolutely amazing. 50 things to do is something that I absolutely love as well. And actually, you know, it's, it's 50 things to do before you're five. I'd struggle to do those 50 things before I'm 50, which is many, many, many years away, obviously. But continuing with these themes, there are so many great takeaways from the day. I've mentioned Nick's presentation uh, first up this morning. Uh, what we learned about teaching and learning and those evidence-informed approaches, it was, again, really, really positive to hear Nick talking about dual coding, uh, and Kate uh, sharing about cognitive load earlier. These are all great things to take away about how we can best support our teachers um, with their work of, of uh, teaching our young people. Because actually, going back to that Bananarama principle, it isn't so much what you do. Great technology use doesn't have to be all bells and whistles and singing and dancing. It's actually simple stuff and that you know, doing a few things really, really well uh, that can make the biggest amount of difference. That marginal gains approach. Thank you too to Sophie. This is the conversation that happened earlier with Kate and, and Nick. Um, the, the beauty of being the last person on is I can actually take some screenshots and include some of the things that I've been seeing over the course of the day in my presentation uh, as well. But what else have we seen under lockdown? Well, community, um, lots and lots of us today are, are users and good users and, and regular users and have been for many years of social media and Twitter um, but a community thing that I wanted to share with you and, and why is this session reasons to be cheerful well, it's not just the great things we've seen across the day today we see it all over the place happening all of the time education is a force for good and there's more that unites us than divides us um, here we are today, we're learning and sharing together. We're giving up time, most of us, during our actual school summer holidays. And we are stronger together. And we see that in, in, in by the bucket load. Um, here's somebody um, that I want to do a big shout out for. This is Nick Corston. He runs loads of community events around art and steam and creativity. And I believe Nick's joined us uh, during the session today. And when Glastonbury was cancelled, what did he do? Well, he set up his own virtual Glastonbury event. Um, and here's a short video of that uh, with uh, some conversations in here with um, the Kemp brothers uh, from Spandau Ballet. And I was standing in a, in a toilet in a Berlin um, uh, bar, and um, so we saw Spandau Ballet together. And one of us said, That'd make a good name for a band. Hi, I'm Lenny. I love you. I love you. Uh, and that was, the, that was the free festival main site. <laughs> I'm looking forward to what we're going to do with all that cardboard. My mum and dad. Sent me across the road, joined me into this drum club, and it kind of it literally changed my life. Two evenings a week, 10 p.m. lesson. But it worked um, by, yeah. yes, demystifying art. So where's gold? Yeah. Like a high wall. Keep going in spite of it all. Yeah. 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 You know, that that took place. Um, it wasn't the real Glastonbury Pyramid stage. That was, as you might have uh, sort of picked up and realised from some of the stills and, and little clips from the video there. This was actually done with green screening, the pyramid stage there. But by doing this, Nick brought together people from all over the world to share and have a replacement Glastonbury event. Education is such a fantastic uh, industry uh, and profession to be involved in. It brings out the best of us, I think. And we've seen the best of this uh, under the most difficult of situations. Bookie did a big shout out for school leaders uh, in her in, at the end of her presentation. I'll do a huge, massive thanks and shout out, not just to school leaders, but teachers who've been giving it their all for months and months and months and months. How many are still working now? And here we are on uh, in our summer holidays and we're all still coming together. So a big shout out for Nick. 
uh, there and to, to all teachers. And we, we see these things being shared all over the place. Bookie shared earlier the UK Edu stories show that we do on a Thursday night, uh, 7 p.m. on YouTube. Um, we had an episode, um, uh, so Bookie shared one uh, with Michelle Grant. I want to share a different one uh, that we did with a focus on well-being, mindfulness and motivation for teachers under lockdown. Uh, we had uh, Andrew Cowley on the show, uh, the author of The Wellbeing Toolkit, a, a real uh, fantastic but with loads of sage advice about uh, uh, supporting well-being within your school. We had Ollie Lewis, um, again, an international flavour to this show. We had Ollie Lewis, who's an assistant head teacher at a school in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we had Chandan Jha from... Uh, from from, uh, bomb, uh, from Mumbai, sorry, uh, engaging in the show as well. Teachers really do give above and beyond. Um, I was talking in the chat just before I came on. You know, um, Adrian mentioned in his presentation uh, about um, you know the expectation that teachers are available twenty four seven for support. But what profession engages in their own professional learning and, and, and connections uh, and connecting and, and and working together and those relationships as much as we see from teachers uh, using social media, we've seen a real uh, explosion of, of teachers really doing it for themselves. These these, these last six months and it's such a fantastic um uh, uh sort of hallmark i think of our profession that we're so keen eager and able to uh, be there to support and work with each other um, it's a really fantastic profession as i say to to be involved in if you want to subscribe to the uh, uk edu stories channel you can do so at that uh, shortened link there I wanted to do uh, a big shout out as well to head teachers, though. Here's a, a great example of a head teacher, uh, Chris Dyson, who really spearheaded things moving forward um, at the start of lockdown, providing free meals. This is before the government actually said that the, the free meals would still be available uh, for those uh, disadvantaged families here in the UK. But a real, as it says here, hashtag community hero uh, is Chris Dyson. Well worth a follow on Twitter as well, if you're not already. Another big shout out for another uh, head teacher, um, here, Vic Goddard, he was the head teacher in the first series of the Educating series on, on Channel 4, Educating Essex. Uh, he's Vic Goddard on Twitter. But again, we saw um, th that initiative from Chris being really spearheaded and pushed further by Marcus Rashford from Man United. Um, I'm not going to get involved in the whole football conversation. But um, a huge mural being added to the wall at Passmore School in Essex uh, in recognition and inspiring young people to have the same sort of vision and values that Marcus showed showed uh, under lockdown and that's a real uh, reflection of how Vic is in his leadership in the school uh, as well. Um, someone else who's been absolutely fantastic during the whole of lockdown is uh, this gentleman here um, who um, has been absolutely fantastic and um, uh, Jeff um, and, and why am I forgetting his saying now while I'm presenting? Uh, he has been absolutely, uh, uh, he's the um, leader of um, the Association for uh, Schools and College Leaders. Um, but he's been uh, a head teacher for many, 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 many years and has been really key in supporting um, uh, uh, teachers and schools and leaders uh, during the course of the uh, the lockdown. Why I can't remember his surname now, um, don't let me, uh, Jeff Barton, there we go. Um, uh, don't call it literacy is a book he wrote which is also really really good but uh, we, we we see the the leadership coming through really really clearly and if you've been involved in leadership uh, and seen some of the things that have been coming out from the dfe during the course of lockdown here in the uk you know it's, it's been coming out on a daily sometimes by daily basis with the advice that we've had to respond to and you know i, I don't work in schools anymore full-time but my goodness like I, I, I really feel for all of these people in leadership, you know, if you have to sort of contend with and deal with all of this uh, uh, throughout lockdown, it's been absolutely, uh, again, a fantastic job done by all, but under the most difficult of circumstances. We've seen some great initiatives come about during this time as well. This one from um, uh, Toria Clare on Twitter. Uh, and today is Tuesday. If you check the hashtag Tiny Voice Tuesday Unite, it's a fantastic initiative uh, to bring teachers together who don't have much of a, a, of a, a network, a professional learning network. Um, it's a huge initiative. If you look at that hashtag today, you'll see loads and loads on there uh, about teachers sort of coming together and working together and uniting to support each other. Fantastic initiatives, again, such as this one from Ivo Hanan from Dubai. Uh, Global Staff Room Sunday. There's been so many fantastic hallmarks of what a great profession um, 
um, uh, teaching uh, is and that's something that I'm so proud to be uh, engaging and involved with and again a huge shout out to Frog as well they've been absolutely you know instrumental in making sure that learning has happened in so many schools so some schools who, uh, who took up Frog's uh, offer um, and you can see it here uh, announced on, on, on Twitter back in March um, access to uh, Frog Play some schools have actually continued because of access to Frog during this time as well that wouldn't have otherwise happened uh, without it now, engineers make bridges, artists make paintings, scientists make rockets. But the thing is, teachers make all of those things. So that's my little presentation. There's so many reasons to be cheerful. Um, the tweet from your seat competition today. Uh, it was my pleasure to um, see these tweets coming out. Um, the winner is, well, actually, before we go to the winner, uh, I wanted to do a second place uh, and maybe we could work out a little prize for this, but because check this out. Uh, Sarah Hazel um, has actually been engaging with uh, and taking part in the conference today uh, from her holiday, giving up her actual holiday time. I don't know if she was actually in, uh, using her phone under the water there with her scuba gear on, uh, but I was so impressed with her commitment there, Sarah. So thank you so much for engaging uh, with everything today um and then uh, the actual winner though and um if you want to do a little virtual drum roll the winner is oh only kidding it's not me uh, the the real winner is and i was so it, it, I, I did a proper laugh out loud it's not very often when you type lol you do actually laugh out loud uh, but when i did see this uh tweet from nikki taylor i thought well we're really reaching uh, the full the, the full audience here today uh, so congratulations to uh, Nikki uh, there for uh, that uh, tweet and congratulations to you for that uh, uh, prize. Uh, and I'm sure Lucy and the team will be in touch about how to organise that. And I understand that Nina um, has uh, donated uh, some prizes uh, as well into the into the pot uh, as well with all of that. Thank you so much, everybody, for such a fantastic event uh, today. It's been really, really uh, uh, fantastic and, and a real privilege to be uh, involved with. Thank you so much much indeed thank you thank you so much mark thank you very much for um sharing all of those insights with us and uh, loving a bit of spandau ballet there <laughs> so thank you again and thank you for our, for all your help that you've put into this helping us actually shape the day right I I, I, i'm going to invite quickly gareth so thanks sorry mark thank you very much i'm going to invite gareth back on to now uh, I know Gareth has a couple of words to say before we close out the conference so over to Gareth. Hi folks uh, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone I think that actually worked really well that was a, that was a good day thank you so much to all the speakers thank you to everybody that's attended I think um, almost everybody that started is still here so extra special thank you for that um, the chat's been brilliant I think that's been a real a real winner um, if you'd like us to run other stuff like this, you know how to get hold of us. I think we can run more of these. Certainly the cost of lunch has been a lot cheaper doing it this way, so the more the merrier for me. Um, I, I've got four things written down in, in front. Uh, I don't know what you guys wrote down. Just, just four, four simple bits. Simplicity, certainty, parental engagement, and isolated students uh, were the four big shout-out things. I don't know what you guys wrote down. Feel free to throw something in the comments but i think that was a really powerful day um i learned a lot from it i hope you guys did as well thank you lucy and the team you've done an awesome job you should be very proud of yourselves thank you so much catch you later folks bye bye so this this will be recorded we will be sharing the videos back with you uh, we will be sending out a survey after the event to see if you'd like to keep this kind of thing going and feel part of of this we've really enjoyed um, hosting this event and hopefully giving you something to take back to school and feeling part of something so thank you to mark to nina to bookie to sophie to all of our schools that have presented as well um, thank you everybody for taking time out during the summer holidays you are a testament Thank you very much and uh, we'll be in touch soon. So thank you. Bye.